Hi, everyone. Are you able to hear? Great. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, this is the plug and play session, run your node from home. First things first, please everyone put on your headphones or you're not going to be able to hear anything. Um, and next up, introducing um, Bernd Lapp as well as Stefan Ponet from Avado. Hello everyone, welcome. We're presenting Avado, the easiest solution to validate on Nier. I'm Bernd Lapp and this is my co-founder, uh, Stefan Ponet. We're going to take you to the presentation today and explain what Avado is. So first of all, we started in 2018 to build uh, devices that help developers to spend time on developing instead of maintaining, building a node, maintaining a node, and running a node. So our focus was on developers. Later, in 2020, a lot of chains started with staking. And uh, we found a way to make it really, really easy to stake uh, through running in the node on our devices, activating the validator, and then uh, activating your stake on the, on the device, and taking you through the whole process without any technical knowledge or any um, maintenance that you have to have to do actively yourself. And uh, so from 2018 until today, we've added more and more blockchains. And uh, we're happy to announce that we will also add NIR as a validator. We also run NIR as a validator already. And we'll talk about the chunk only producer uh, later in the speech. We have some learnings and ob observations of what happened through those four years. It's, um, it's amazing that it's already four years for us. Uh, what happened in those four years through our own product, but also to the whole community, to the whole blockchain space in general. And uh, maybe Stefan can explain what these learnings are. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so, as Beren said, we've been uh, doing this for quite a while. So, we've uh, gathered a lot of feedback from, uh, from all our users. And so, a couple of uh, points that I want to touch on, which was also like new for us at the start. We, we thought, yeah, maybe... Maybe these are things that, that people take for granted, uh, we, or at least we took for granted. Uh, so first of all is that users don't want to spend a lot of time on researching the right hardware. So if you want to participate in any of these blockchains, it makes sense that like, for one chain you need these kind of requirements, for another chain you need these kinds of requirements. Um, if you leave it up to people, they start like assembling all kinds of things with either old laptops, uh, scrap desktop uh, parts that they still have left over, or they go on the internet to, to try to source the ideal hardware. But it's also not also uh, not always trivial, um, since you're running it on a Linux operating system, you have all these issues with drivers and all that stuff. Um, so people just in general don't want to care about that. That's what we. That's why we did sort of the research uh, for people and came up with a piece of hardware that really fits the bill. Um, so this is the first product. Uh, it's not actually the first product, but it's uh, the i7 model here that is shown. Uh, so it's like completely fanless. Uh, so it means it's 100% silent. So you can just like set it on your desktop and then have it validate for you. Um, so we have different like memory configurations, uh, different SSD combinations, which also determine the price uh, of the product. Um, and then of course, yeah, it's, uh, it's branded so that you can actually see that uh, it's an Avado box that you're working with. Uh, Bernd, next slide, yeah. thank you. Uh, second observation is that yeah, people just don't want to read manuals. So if you want to get started validating or setting up a node, you usually have to go through like pages and pages of documentation, start downloading software, from the project and installing it, so you really uh, need to get to learn that. Um, but it's a cumbersome process to read all those manuals. That's why we uh, create a lot of additional material to help you set up uh, your node very easily. So we have like uh, YouTube channels that we, uh, that we where we put all these explainers uh, in, unboxing videos, uh, and also walkthroughs for each of these uh, dabs that we launch. So uh, more on these dabs later. Uh, another observation is that uh, users, they care more about like the convenience of the whole solution than the absolute decentralization. So decentralization, of course, is the goal that we're all uh, trying to achieve. 
and since we are providing these uh, these devices that you can run from home, there's something that's sort of in the top tier of decentralization, anyways. Uh, but we chose to make like a curated list of dApps that you can install on the device itself. So as you as you can see here, here so this is the user interface of the Avado, um, and you have like all these apps that you can install. So our solution is based on Docker, so that means that basically all these pieces of software that you see here are Docker containers with some metadata around it, like with the logos and descriptions of the, of the package and so forth. Also all the pointers to all the additional resources, like a YouTube video on to specifically set up that piece of uh, software, that specific node. Um, and so we, we curate that with our team. Uh, we also do the, the maintenance of it, so that means you don't have to worry about all the updates of the software itself, as uh, since we are updating them and it comes with a sort of an automatic push, it's opt-in, so you don't have to do it, you can uh, switch it on or off. Uh, but if you opt-in, then you can um, yeah, automatically have your node updated. So the whole idea is that you can just set it up, it's sort of a fire and forget solution. You set up with an, uh, with an onboarding wizard, you configure your, your staking nodes, and from that moment on, you should be fine. You shouldn't worry about the maintenance of the node. You can just like, monitor it, and as long as it runs well, you don't need to maintain it since we push all the updates. Um, and it's really like an appliance. So uh, you saw the, the pictures of the box itself, uh, and it should be as simple as setting up IKEA furniture. You just need to plug it in, connect to the, to the Wi-Fi, you come to an onboarding wizard, you set it up into your network, and then you're done. So it doesn't require you to plug in uh, a screen or a keyboard or whatsoever, so it's completely headless. Um, and yeah, as you see, there's a lot of people that actually like uh, this approach. Um, yeah, so it's, it's nice to see <laughs> all that feedback from our community. Bernd. So in July, then, uh, NIR announced that it will have chunk-only validators, or chunk-only producers. So this means right now there's mainnet validators, and there's 100 seats available. And it's very expensive to get into these seats, and you need to maintain your node very well. Um, but in the, f in the near future, near, um, there will be chunk-only producers. So shards, every shard will have their own validators. And this is an opportunity for people to start validating at home, for example. So there's again slots available. And uh, we have a package in our DAP store that you can download and activate. And it takes you through the process, as we will see later, how to uh, validate and, and put your stake into play. And the great thing is that people can deposit to it um, from, from other, uh, or investors can deposit to it, so you can even st earn more rewards on your solution. So, at the end, you will, if you run it yourself, you can earn 100% of your own rewards. You don't have to give to any third party, any, any margin. Um, you, you could receive or should receive delegations as well from other people, which earns you more rewards. You, but the main thing, as we always said, as we said in the beginning, is you keep this the network decentralized because people run it at home. They run it. Um, they have full control over the hardware, and uh, we pos we keep the, the system updated. So there is no maintenance needed from the user, um, and there is enough information and support from our whole community, uh, which we also explain later, which is really really nice. Maybe, Stefan, you can take them through the UI. Yeah, so also one of these uh, ob other observations that the uh, users are sort of scared of a command line interface. Uh, that's why we create this onboarding wizard. And one of, uh, so this is a, an example. So this is for the, uh, the Avado Near uh, package, uh, how it looks. So it's, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, so we try to onboard each of these dApps, each of these nodes in a web UI that we build ourselves and maintain. Uh, so that means for any package that we install, you never have to touch a command line. That, that's sort of our motto. Um, so yeah, like uh, if there are like dependencies, like this is not the case here, but for other blockchains, you have to like install different pieces of software to, to jointly uh, start validating. Then all these dependencies are taken care of for you. So you just say like, oh, I want to stake on, on this chain and, and the system take, uh, takes care of the rest. Um, so here in this case for the Avado uh, near package, there's, it's a simple wizard where you can, so it spins up the node, so it starts synchronizing the blocks the moment you, you install the package. Uh, and then through 
yeah, the, the information that you get from the near website, you can set up and, and create your uh, validation pool and create your staking keys. And then here, there's like a simple interface. We can just upload uh, your staking key and uh, add it to your, to your uh, nodes. And then it just starts validating as long as you're within the, the tier of, um, of stake that you need to put in. On the next screen, uh, this is also one of the maintenance screens of the, of the package. So each package has, besides the, the wizard's uh, screen, also have, has like a uh, sort of a maintenance screen where you can dive into more details if you really want to know what's going on with your validator. Um, this is the screen to go to and it also outputs like all the logs of your uh, validator. Um, so you can also consult that. You can like upload and download files from the, from the package itself, restart it and so forth. So all the, uh, the more in detail um, maintenance is, is to be done there. Um, since not all blockchains, of course, are fit uh, for running at home, uh, so some blockchains are better than, than the other, uh, we offer two options. So we started out with only like sort of the concept of solo staking at home, so which is the uh, Avado at home. So the benefits there is it's just a one-time payment. So you just buy the box. It's like the, all the updates from the, for the whole lifetime of the box, which is approximately two to three years, uh, is included in that price. So there's no additional fee for these updates or so. So it's, it's all included. So it's a one-time payment. Then you own the hardware yourself. And that's sort of the best tier of decentralization that you can get. Uh, on the other side, because we have, for example, a lot of customers in the US, and in the US is um, like the, the power grids is often much less reliable uh, than, than, for example, in Europe. Um, so a lot of times nodes go offline and so forth. If you don't want that, we also have a, a solution, an Avado, that you can run in the cloud, uh, where we provide the software on a server for you, uh, which is then, so you're not paying, uh, you're not buying the hardware, then you're renting the hardware from, uh, from us. And that's like a more interesting uh, point for if you want to have stability or if you don't have the bandwidth at home uh, to run that. If your internet line is capped, for example, then you can also opt for uh, that solution. Yeah, so we, we've made, uh, we've run a validator ourselves, the mainnet validator, you, f you can find us in the list. Um, so we've had quite some experience now for the last year to, to run the mainnet validator. And uh, if you're interested to, to delegate to us, we even have a 0% fee that we will keep. Uh, so there's no reward going to us. We maintain it because we really think this is interesting for us to, to learn from and to do so. Um, so if you scan the QR code, you can directly delegate to us if you want to. It's really easy. Um, but in general, we, our goal is to really take the user from uh, the investment he, he made into a token to really validating the, ch the chain itself. So and there's a lot of fear involved, first of all, because most of the users that have a token are not developers. You know, they've invested in this and they like the technology, they like the, the philosophy maybe, but they don't have the skills to run the, the node themselves. So we take them from fear to being really a confidence, confident staker at the end. And we do this mostly through the help of our community. So we have a great incentive program inside our community to help each other. And uh, we do this through the support. So we take a percentage of our sales, of the revenue we do, we take this as a budget and we put this into support. And our community is mostly on Telegram. We're using Telegram to communicate every package, every, every chain, every node has a different channel on Telegram. And each of these channels has a bot integrated. We call it Avadin. And Avadin is sort of recognizing if somebody thanks another person. So if I get support, if I have a question and somebody answers this question to me, a community member, then I can thank him. There's a specific sentence I have to write, but it's very easy. It's dish praise to, and then you say why. Um, and this is recorded by Avadin. And at the end, Avadin, our bot, then gives a monthly review of the, the praise, of the thank yous, and we simply divide the budget that we have among the people that gave support. And this can be between $20 or $30 per praise, per thank you. Depends on the sales. And we think this is scalable, or we see this is scalable, because the more people buy devices, the bigger the budget gets, but also the more questions will be asked for support. 
So this goes hand in hand. If there's less devices we sell, there's probably less questions because less new users join and so on. So it really scales up and down for us perfectly. And we are a small team and still have a great community support. So there's, uh, we've, we've seen that uh, people that come new to our channel are really impressed by the, the, by the response they get. So we have uh, also a gamified approach. So we have this, this list of uh, people that, that give support and you can look into the list, you can be maybe on top of the list, but at the end it's really the, the incentive, um, the payout we do, which is really nice for, for people to earn a second income. And this is again something, passive income is, is the main topic we also try to solve with, uh, with the device. And you can see some, some of the users, they, they tweet about it and they, they really like the kindness, the, the approach behind this. So um, we have a very helpful community, then there's no, they, they realize that we don't have a big team and, and still the support is really, really good. Um, and again, you, you can earn money by just running the box and helping other people. So that, that also helps you. And in addition, we also have an NFT. I'm just explaining this because it's uh, maybe a, a use case that is very helpful and is, um, I think it's coming up. So we use an NFT with every sale. So the user can mint his own NFT and the NFT has a purchase date, has some information about uh, the purchase itself, but not user data. There's no user data himself because we don't need to know who is the, the user, but we need to know you own the device. So it's proof of ownership is this NFT for us. And if we give, we have a two year warranty on the hardware and if a user has any problems, he can sort of show us the NFT, show us the, the, that he owns the device and then we can give him uh, support and, and um, do maintenance on the device itself. In addition, and this is something we will roll out in the future, access, it will also be a digital rights management tool. So the NFT will give access to certain parts of the, of the UI, of the software. So that we definitely know that this person owns the device and is able to use it. So the NFT for us is not, is not artwork, it's not a rock, it's not a, an ape or a, a punk. It's really proof of ownership and that's very helpful for us and again makes it, uh, we use the blockchain technology in, in its core version. And uh, yeah, coming to the end already, maybe you see our pupils. Uh, we love Nier. Uh, we really think it's, this is a great technology and we're happy now that with the chunk only producers, we finally can, can sort of offer something to the community to, to actively, individually at home participate. And uh, we hope that the community also loves Avado at the end and uses us. And uh, if, you, if you can and want to, please visit us on ava.do. So it's our name with a dot between the A and the, the D, ava.do. Um, yeah, look at our products and reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, and I hope this was helpful for you. Thank you very much. Not sure if there's any questions now. We still have two minutes. Uh, maybe we need a microphone, sorry for that. <laughs> there's over there. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the economics of uh, running your own node. So um, have you got any data on the likely payback period for somebody who buys one of your hardware? Yes, it, it all depends on the stake you put in. But um, so first of all, the, 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 um, the thing you don't pay to is, is your own, you don't pay a margin to a third party. So there's like sometimes 5% up to 10% or even more you see on, on the validator list. So you have to calculate that that is uh, the return you already get. Uh, then the amount of stake and the return you get from that is, is based on the blockchain you stake on and the amount you can stake on. Plus you can get delegations and the reward or the, the, the fee you take from it. So that I, it's, it's not, I cannot generalize it, but it's uh, usually within half a year you can uh, sort of re have a return on, on investment. And the only cost you actually have is electricity and bandwidth, like your internet. 
most likely you will not buy a separate line for this device. You will use the internet you have. And energy consumption is like one kilowatt hour per day. So that's, uh, it's like a light bulb. You know, so it's not, the cost is not very high. It's initial cost to buy the device, but then you have a, a nice return of investment. And we see the device running for three, four years until you have to probably renew it because the technology has evolved already. Thank you. Time for one last question, if there is one. Okay, if not, thank you very much. And again, see you on our website. Thank you so much about our team. Um, it was really exciting to learn about all the different ways you can help users onboard um, from a validator perspective. So next up, we have Pagoda. Um, blockchain development made easy. And speaking from Pagoda is Austin Baggio. Thank you everybody for your patience. We're just sorting out a little technical difficulties with this computer and we'll be right back shortly. All right, hey everybody. Can everyone hear me? Can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me? How's everybody doing? Welcome to NearCon, yeah, this is awesome, day two. Um, I've got a quick question before I jump in. How many people have actually deployed something to testnet on Near? Anybody? Anybody on mainnet? Anybody on mainnet? Okay, cool. People without their hands up, I'd love you to open your laptops up because we're gonna change that today. We're actually gonna go and launch an app today. Um, so. I'm getting ahead of myself. So I'm Austin, um, I'm a product at Pagoda. I'm working on the Pagoda console, and I've studied uh, software engineering, marketing, done everything from product to software, everything in between. 
and uh, I'm from Toronto, Ontario. Uh, last week I'm actually coming off the legs of a really long cycling trip. We do about a thousand kilometer trip every year, so in August my entire personality turns into that of a cyclist. You can ask my friends, it's pretty insufferable and it's very hard, but I'm going to talk about stuff that's not hard today. And um, I'm sure that you probably heard the name Pagoda. So, um, our entire mission is just to make Web3 development as easy as possible. So uh, we're going to try and do some of that today because what I'd love to share with you is how we're going to build on Pagoda in literally 15 minutes using a tool called Pagoda Console. So we're going to go all the way from just starting brand new application. We launched this amazing feature called Pagoda Templates and that makes it as easy as possible to get started uh, launching an app. And then we're going to go through something we call Pagoda Interact, which is interacting with a chain directly. I'm using, if you're familiar with like a Postman, it's similar to that, but we're actually interacting with the chain directly. And then we're going to go through some amazing features like uh, alerts, analytics, enhanced API, and all of that other stuff. So are we ready? Laptops open, everybody? <laughs> awesome, cool. Um, I would just want to direct everyone to pagoda.co. If you're on a laptop, that's the best way to do it. Otherwise, scan this QR code, and it'll bring you to a link tree that just has a ton of uh, like workshop demos, um, the link to the site, and, and, and all that fun stuff. So I'll leave this up on screen. I see some phones out. OK, amazing. Awesome, cool. I'm going to jump into the live demo. We're not going to go straight into questions. So let's just get started. So here's, oh, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. Um, so here's, here's Pagoda Console, and you'll notice that the first thing that we have on the right here is um, an area where you can just go and launch a project. We just finished the NFT example, so this is the one that we're going to walk through today. Um, you'll see that when you open this up, um, it's basically uh, a quick landing page where you can go and view the code on GitHub. So um, think like this is powered by our, our Near Examples, so we have an entire GitHub repo called Near Examples, and this is the NFT example where you can go in, you can explore the code, do all the fun stuff that you'd wanna that you wanna do, and this is like just essentially like a very real smart contract that we'll see that we've audited and, and uh, that's working. So um, let's jump back into the console, and we're gonna just uh, deploy and explore this project. Awesome. Cool. Cool, so I just clicked on Deploy and Explore, and what's happening in the background right now is we're doing what we call a dev deploy, and this is essentially um, creating a new account, um, funding that with some near on testnet, and then we're in the background, we're building that contract, so building and compiling down uh, to Wasm, and then deploying that Wasm uh, right to testnet. So you'll see that uh, it's a dev deploy, so it's got a little bit of a funny name. It's like dev plus some timestamp set of numbers, so we'll just go ahead and we'll click on that, and you'll notice that um, similar to when you open up Explore, like everything happens the way that you would expect when you just launch something onto testnet. So we just show that right here, right within console. So let's go ahead and let's mint an NFT. Um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to initialize the contract. So I'm gonna just go here with new default meta. Um, the owner ID, I'm gonna use a testnet account that I know works. Uh, Austin test uh, testnet. This doesn't take a deposit. And then we can send a transaction. Um, it's going to ask me to log into sender wallet. Do you want to jump up and just <laughs> having, to, having to switch laptops just to use my colleagues, and I didn't have my, uh, my wallet logged in. Yeah, sure. Awesome. So instead, we're going to get some bonus coverage. We're going to go through our wallet select flow, where we can see the different wallets that you can log into. Awesome. So this is using Wallet Selector. So as you saw, there's a few wallets that we support. We support Mind Your Wallet, um, uh, Sender Wallet, um, and Amazing. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, so you might just want to switch the, when you're creating it, just switch the wallet. Cool. Awesome, so let's try that again. Let's, uh, uh, so essentially when we're initializing a contract, I'm just gonna go ahead and send this transaction. And now that I've logged into a wallet, this is basically just gonna hit the blockchain directly. Um, and as we see, the transaction executed successfully. So similar to, in, uh, similar to within Explorer, you'll see the transaction results here. So I can expand this, it'll give you the response, it'll give you the output, it'll give you the inspect where you can go and look at like what block height was, how much gas was actually burnt, all that fun stuff. Um, and now let's do, the, let's do the actual fun part where we can go ahead and mint an NFT. 
token ID, we'll just do one, two, three, receiver ID, dot testnet. And I'm just going to include uh, blank, uh, some blank metadata. And I'm going to attach way too much near here just to make sure that the, the deposit works. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to send this. Uh, it should be able to mint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. We'll go ahead and we'll approve this transaction. Oh, sorry. What is? Let me let me initialize it with the MT one. Redeploy it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. I'm just going to go through this flow and just just uh, deploy it again, just to make sure that we can actually uh, uh, hit that contract live. This is the fun with live demos when the HDMI doesn't work. You always have to change your laptop and make sure uh, to run uh, turn it on new accounts. Okay, cool. Was it sender or was it, yeah. This one, a mine here? Yeah, okay. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so like I mentioned, we're just going to initialize this contract. We're going to use the right address, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to mint an NFT. Uh, all right, two, two, three, see where I be. We're going to just going to pass in some empty JSON here, but you can attach the metadata in there that'll actually give you, um, like, the NFT with an example, uh, or that, that actually goes to, like, a, a live image. Awesome. So it's going to ask me to go ahead and sign this transaction. We'll approve this. Cool. And once again, as you can see, the transaction the transaction executes successfully. So you can see it here um, with the token ID, the um, the receiver ID, and then all of the metadata where you actually have like the image and, and, and all that, uh, like the image hash and all that shows up here. So the next the next thing that I'd like to show off is alerts. So for those of you that actually have contracts running on mainnet, something that you definitely want to know is when something happens to the uh, to your application or to anything that's happening on chain. So what you can do is you can, uh, you can set up an alert, which I'm going to have listen to this contract specifically, and you can set a bunch of different conditions. So think like if you have a successful transaction or you can look at a specific function name. So let's say you're building an NFT marketplace. You want to know when an NFT is minted so that you can go and do something and go and celebrate it. But another one which is really important is like let's say you run like a DeFi protocol or something like that, and, and you want to know if like your account balance has changed. Like you build, you're building a bridge or something like that. If your account balance gets drained by more than whatever, 20%, you can set some, uh, some alert up that'll send uh, a notification to you. So for the purpose of this demo, we'll just take a look at what a successful action uh, looks like from the uh, NFT contract that we just initialized. And here's the different destinations that you can pick. So you can send them to Telegram. You can send them to a webhook, which is amazing because you can then automate what the response is going to be. So you don't actually just have to get an email and do nothing. You can set up a webhook to do pretty much anything. Um, for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to use an email address. I've got a temp mail address here so I don't go and spam. Awesome. And I'll just go and verify this email. Awesome. Cool. So now this email, uh, now this email address can receive, once I, uh, once I verified here, this email address can now receive uh, uh, email notifications. We do this, obviously, so that no one can use our uh, Pagoda console as a doxing machine and just send a million alerts off. Um, 
great, cool. So now that this email has been verified, it's been automatically selected. So I'm going to go ahead and actually create this alert. We'll go back to we'll go back to Pagoda Interact here, and we'll send another transaction off. Um, uh, we'll just mint another NFT. Let's give this, um, and we'll use the oh. We'll make this also the receiver. We'll attach an empty payload. And again, I'm just going to attach way too much near for a deposit to make sure it goes through. And then I'm going to go ahead and send this transaction. Cool. So now, so now what we'll see is that, uh, or once we've signed this transaction, We've successfully minted this NFT, and what we'll see in this, um, in the, uh, or let's make sure that this actually sent successfully. So let's take a look at the execution. Okay, amazing. This is our new token with our new ID. Let's go and take a look at our email inbox. Amazing. That alert fired successfully. So this just notified us that we have just had a successful transaction. So again, imagine like an account drain, some specific function was called. This will just help developers have better control so that they can know what's happening to their application before their users do. Um, amazing. So one, uh, one more feature that I want to show off is I want to take a look at, uh, I want to take a look at um, some analytics. So, as opposed to just looking at the boring analytics from the function or from the contracts that we just called, I'm going to go and find. Uh, I'm just going to go to Explorer, and I'm going to try and find uh, Ref Finance or some. Or actually, does anyone have a mainnet contract that we want to take a look at um, with analytics? Which one? I can't. I can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, cool. Let's just look at some recent transactions on mainnet, and we'll find an account. Uh, this is test. Oh, perfect. Cool. Okay. All right. Let's do. Let's do sweat. Dot welcome. Dot near. They're here with us today. Let's let's hope that they've got a whole bunch of uh, they've got a whole bunch of uh, transactions that we can take a look at. So here's a mainnet address. So. You'll notice that um, you'll notice that this is not a contract that I've worked on, right? Like you can just go to mainnet and you can take a look at any contract because this is just pulling data from chain. So um, now I'll go ahead and take a look at the analytics page. This is powered by Wombi. Okay. This is typically powered by Wombi. Is there? Okay, here we go. Amazing. We can all blame conference Wi-Fi for that one, right? Like, I think that live demos are always a. Uh, of course, and of course, this trans uh, this uh, uh, this contract has very few results. I think the ref finance one is v2. Dot. Let me try and find uh, another. Welcome.near. Okay. No, do you have a do you have a good one? I've got a bunch of analytics here in this. Yeah. Nearcon. Nearcon. Dot. Dot. Key palm. Key palm. Dot near. Dot near. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. So what you'll see is that instead of having to build analytics from scratch like anybody would from, for their blockchain application, we just do it for the developers so that they can just jump in, they can spend more time coding, more time getting insights, and more time growing their application as opposed to having to build an analytics suite. So we show things like total number of transactions, total, uh, uh, total transacted value, liquid balance, total gas spent, uh, and, and, and all this amazing stuff. So super cool. Um, the next thing that I'd love to show off is like now that you've actually built an app, and like let's say we're going back to this NFT marketplace example, um, w you may want to you may want to actually interact with some data using what we call the enhanced API. And uh, what the enhanced API is is that it's a it's um, 
uh, it, it allows it allows developers to go and query uh, like data that you normally would want to find on chain for things like NFTs and for other coins. So, for example, um, you can take a look at the NFT example or the like the NFT uh, enhanced API here, and we've already pre-formatted the schema to get an entire user's collection. Um, so we've already formatted and, we, uh, and we've, we've built this schema out so that you just simply have to add your API key and then you can, uh, you can find someone's entire collection. So I'm gonna put one of my colleagues on blast here. She said I could do this. Uh, and I'm just gonna go and grab her entire NFT collection. And this is like, again, just super simply querying the entire like, actual on-chain data using our RPC service so that you can actually just return values and you can, uh, uh, you can interact with the chain directly using this. So you'll see that this response actually just using uh, the API key and the account ID didn't have to build an index or didn't have to do any of that. And I was able to grab uh, actual on-chain data to actually return NFTs. So let's take a look at the first one. JavaScript SDK launch, amazing. That's a good selfish plug. That, that was the most recent NFT, which is our launch NFT for the JavaScript SDK. So, uh, super cool. Um, amazing. That's, uh, that's what I wanted to show from developer console. So, I'm just gonna jump back into this presentation and let's just like do like a really quick reflection on what we did there. And I wanna invite everyone to go back to pagoda.co so that they can actually go ahead and launch this NFT project from scratch and you can become a, uh, a Web3 developer as quickly as possible. So what we did was we launched, we launched a project using Pagoda, then we interacted, uh, we interacted with the live on-chain data using Pagoda Interact, and then we took a look at analytics that were pre-built right out of the box. We set up an alert and we uh, used enhanced API in order to grab uh, some more data off-chain. So this is the totality of what Pagoda is right now, uh, what Pagoda console looks like, and uh, we're gonna be working incredibly hard to make sure that we can keep shipping as many features as possible in here uh, to just make developing on Near as easy as possible. So, cool. Thanks, everybody. Is there any questions? Cool. Awesome. Thanks again. Oh, there's one question over here. Excuse me? Uh, will it be possible to deploy uh, on mainnet using Pagoda Console? Uh, not currently, but that's definitely something that's on the roadmap is we want to make that entire deployment pipeline as easy as possible. So right now we just have the templates that do that dev deploy onto testnet, but I could see very, very soon in the future, hopefully we'll be able to do the entire end-to-end -end suite. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Awesome. I'll do the shameless plug once again. You can find anyone wearing these Pagoda t-shirts. We have the lanyards on. Um, we're walking around. We've got a booth over there where we'll be doing demos for the rest of the day. So you can go and check out Pagoda. You can check out the console. We can take a look at uh, any on-chain uh, interaction using our analytics and we can walk you through the, uh, the console again. Cool. Thanks again. Oh, another question back there. Yeah. Hi there. Um, is it possible to also launch smart contracts or just NFTs? Yeah, yeah. So the um, uh, the uh, the uh, the launch and explore project, the for the uh, we have a repo called Near Dash Examples, and there's a few in there. There's like NFT, fungible token, guest book, and a few other examples. We finished the NFT example just in time for NearCon. So like in the very very short term future, we're going to be focusing on some of the other ones. So in the uh, in the long term, you'll be able to launch a ton of contracts uh, on the uh, using using Pagoda um, as opposed to just the NFT project. Perfect. Thank you. Of course. Awesome. Was there one more? I thought I saw one hand over there. No. Okay, great. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Austin. Um, next up, we have Vadim Lin from Proximity slash Near. I think he does about everything and is just a, a massive builder in the space. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today about community building from a developer's perspective. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Woo. 
Okay, uh, please raise your hands. Who knows how to build a successful uh, organic uh, crypto community? <laughs> so me either. It's, it's quite uh, mission impossible, but I will tell today about how few best practices what we found building our near native crypto community for the last two years, and the several interesting applications, on-chain applications, what we built in order to make our community members happy. Uh, so, how I am Vadim. I, am, uh, I have been working in NIR for the last year and a half. Uh, mostly I'm building some smart contracts. And uh, I came through the hackathon. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this is our community, what we have for Russian speaking audience, uh, NIR native community for the NIR applications and Aurora Eastern Europe community. So this is just a random slide from Google Analytics about one of our blog posts. So Russian-speaking countries, uh, there are huge of them, like 260 million worldwide speakers. And we try to build uh, this regional hub around those audience, uh, not only CIS countries, but there are a lot of uh, speakers from US, from Europe. Uh, and uh, people in those communities, they suffer quite a lot because uh, Blockchain information is quite complex, a lot of complications, a lot of comp complicated stuff, uh, say terms, uh, some uh, misunderstanding, uh, false information, a lot of rumors which come ahead of facts. And this all creates a very um, toxic uh, environment in chats because people mostly come with some problems. Uh, they have uncertainty about future, about price volatility, hacks, and uh, how we are mitigating this we are trying to create some long-term strategy uh, to support our, peop our crypto community. So our main goal is to give full picture and understanding of what is happening and create effective con content to showcase the power of the whole new ecosystem. Uh, so we distinguish uh, two kinds of community members, uh, supporters and fans. There is a quite interesting uh, phrase in English, fair as a fan is a fan who only pays attention to the favorite team when they are performing well. Say, one blockchain has some pump, and uh, we are speaking about this blockchain. Next day, it, the price is dumping, and we go to another chat to another blockchain. So instead, we are trying to transform our fans to supporters. Uh, supporter knows the feature of the blockchain. It understands some difference, dif 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 differences from one blockchain to another. He knows and appreciates our values, say decentralization, um, data ownership, trust list, and uh, maybe just one of example, he holds token not in a liquid form, not on a, uh, some exchange, but instead he has it on chain, maybe he is taking on a protocol, or maybe he is using some dApps. So one of the biggest part of our job is like routine stuff. We are, we are making uh, the translations with high quality translators with the blockchain experience translating a lot of stuff, not only forums, but some ecosystem use from New Week, Near Insider, uh, government post like uh, community etiquette. We help to translate uh, Wallet, Explorer, several D apps like Refinance to Russian, Ukrainian. And uh, we are building, uh, in order to uh, onboard people, what we found uh, in, in various channels, we are we're creating a lot of different social activities. So not only one main group, but for example, we have okay, we have huge Telegram group and announcement channel for Nier and for both for Nier and Aurora, and also we're supporting a chat for gaming play on Nier, uh, for developers, open web dev, and uh, for traders. So all of them have uh, some huge stats. Uh, so also we have a Twitter and blog. So this is how uh, like I, I try to Photoshop a bit uh, how uh, how we have attraction. For example, we, we try to find some people from other sources, not from near ecosystem, but from outside, attract them, and then uh, create a, a set of onboarding uh, funnels uh, so every person will be able to find some interesting stuff for his own interests and uh, uh, try to in, in, uh, achieve something uh, with, within, this, within his interest. So I think the, the biggest stuff what we are doing we are making a lot of AMA sessions, not only with me, with Ilya, with Alex Shevchenko, with all of the stuff. I think we have at least 50 
big uh, AMA sessions in, uh, in I, I, I'm, and I'm talking about huge communities like exchanges, very big uh, social medias. Uh, the good stuff is that most of them were free of charge because interesting content is what uh, social media also wants to have. So they, want, they are happy to invite Ilya, say, or Alex Shevchenko. And uh, we, we, make, we are making this AMA session. We attract people to our channels. And then we are doing some AMA session of near project within our community. So we don't go to other near ecosystem projects to find some people. But instead, we are giving people from, ab from abroad uh, to near projects. Uh, this is slides about influencers. I really like what we, how we are working with them. Uh, so we, we come to influencers with some strong, big audience, with our target audience. Like maybe some YouTube channels with hundreds of subscribers, uh, with uh, huge traffic. And we are offering them monthly kind of partnership, monthly agreement. Uh, within this month, uh, influencers uh, have to perform, uh, have to make some posts about new, maybe some ecosystem updates, news. Uh, so we have special DAO for these uh, um, funds. And uh, we are doing the AMA session in the beginning, mostly to educate influence themselves, like people who are running this uh, channel. Uh, to educate them about NIR because NIR is very different. Uh, they have quite a lot of difference between other blockchains. So uh, we are making an AMS session. We create some chat to spread news about uh, chat uh, about NIR just to community, just to inf these influencers. And uh, uh, we are maybe maybe we extend this contract for uh, several months. Then we stop uh, doing it. And in the end, uh, influencers already know the ecosystem well. Uh, he already received some, uh, uh, maybe some interest to advertise, some uh, advertising requests from project within the new ecosystem, not from us. Uh, and uh, we as Guild support some useful and meaningful content uh, which is doing by this influencer, by re reposts, by uh, some, uh, uh, maybe uh, again with uh, ecosystem grants. Uh, and uh, another stuff, we are, we are helping influencers to establish uh, staking nodes. Uh, so we are helping them to, with some recommendations about installation, uh, maybe just sending some links how to do it, and uh, we can help them with the initial stake. Um, some community, active, active community members may just restake their, no, their tokens from uh, their existing node to this new node, and in the end, uh, like we have for free uh, influencers who became skin in the game with Nier. So he, when he mentioned Nier, he always asking to. Uh, validate to his node, uh, and he's, he's, he promotes near like he is telling to his audience that uh, this is a long-term interest for him. Uh, and if he is getting some uh, rewards and tokens, he mostly stakes in his node, not uh, sending it to exchange. So just uh, we, we did it several times, and it, it works quite well. Another interesting stuff what we found, what we what we what we got uh, are contests. Uh, they are quite, quite price efficient. For example, we made several YouTube contests. Uh, so we f say we have 10 prizes and we have uh, maybe 50 or even 100 uh, different participants. So the whole YouTube became uh, filled with some videos about near about Aurora, about some interesting activities we have. And uh, interesting uh, approach, what we found, if we put a decision about a winner of this video contest, if community members are voting for the winner, uh, then uh, these content makers are coming to uh, our groups and uh, trying to promote their content uh, to, in order to get vote. And they immediately receive feedback and they are trying to and receive some subscri subscribers. So they uh, have to continue and make new content about NIR. Okay, now maybe closer to technical stage. We made several on-chain applications. Uh, if you remember the slide, to onboard people just from uh, uh, no, to, be, to, to make a chat, a chat, chat member into blockchain user. So we made a quiz chain, which is application to create uh, on-chain, like fully on-chain uh, quizzes. It's a contest where every participant answer question and uh, update the hash. In the end, he has some final hash, and if uh, owner of the quiz reveals a successful hash, then automatically rewards may be distributed to the winner. So it's it's cool tool to 
it's a great tool to make uh, some activities during AMS session because we can tell that, okay, listen carefully, and in the end we will enable this quiz. And if you were good enough, you will have some uh, free tokens. So quizchain.org, uh, check it out. Uh, it's open source. Another stuff what we, ha what we have is uh, uh, tipbot. Uh, it allows users to ju just send tipbot in chat, say in Telegram chat. Mm, uh, and uh, it's an interesting tool to just onboard people because they can, I will, t I will put it, show it later, we ca we, uh, they, they can have a, ca a blockchain account with funds got from tips. So once we made the Tipbot Festival, it was an interesting activity. Uh, community members uh, gave uh, sponsors pool, sponsored pool uh, in order to have some NFT. I will speak about our NFT later. So users gave some prizes, uh, and they were distributed among uh, some community members who, who got the most amount of tips during the festival. So people created a lot of tips, or oh, sorry, memes, uh, some fun stuff, videos, just in order to get some uh, rewards. Uh, but for us, again, it was free. Only we spent only an NFT for uh, uh, sponsors of that uh, contest, and it was like hundreds of near uh, we collected during this uh, event. Also, we got some meme contest. Okay, we focused about some on-chain activities. So we made a, a tournament with some early lists from NFT games, from Human Guild, uh, white list and the early access NFT. Uh, and we had one interesting contest with Rare Finance where people uh, shared their best strategies about farming. And we checked on-chain activity and found winners uh, of that competition. Uh, Tipbot enables account creations. Uh, as you know, on New Year's uh, accounts are not free. So uh, what we did, uh, we made a simple um, uh, tutorial how to make an account. So if you solve a CAPTCHA, if you subscribe to our channel, uh, it gives uh, several near to you, so you cannot e easily fake it without new, a lot of uh, SIM cards. But you, but user will be able, will be very fast onboarded for some activity, say to. On, on, a pre, on some uh, conference, just use, using the Telegram bot. And uh, if somebody is sending link, uh, oh, sorry, send, sending a tip to Telegram, uh, then it can be withdrawn using link drop and create new account. So again, in, in, interesting tool to onboard new users. Several highlights what we achieved uh, during uh, these two years. Uh, for example, Binance uh, added uh, Trading pair near to Russian Rumble is uh, 2021. Uh, this is a, a screenshot from uh, Detrix. They counted a number of uh, mainnet smart contracts. And as you see, CIS region is uh, very, very in, on top of uh, all over the world. In, uh, in, uh, uh, if you will calculate numbers of mainnet smart contracts, uh, this is uh, um, stats from MetaBuild 1. Again, uh, CIS countries, Russia, Ukraine, uh, got the biggest num amount of uh, par participants, uh, much, much more than uh, other countries and the whole Europe. Uh, this is uh, uh, thanks to Aurora Plus, they shared uh, registration on Aurora Plus. As you see, also, with, with, with huge advantage, uh, our, this, our regional hub is leading uh, on Aurora Plus registrations. Oh, and uh, also, so I spoke now about uh, attraction. Now let's speak about engagement and retention. We found one interesting uh, approach. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, mm, st uh, you, way of uh, getting interest on blockchain called Launchpad, when uh, you can have some tokens which are not listed yet before the TGE. So you have some, like, some you, like you have a lottery ticket. Maybe it will be very expensive after all. So we are trying to f ask uh, all, all projects within the Neuro ecosystem to come to us and uh, uh, distribute the early tokens even before the TGE, token generation event. So we had this for Bureau Cash, for Sweetcoin, for Aurora once. Uh, so it, it, and it uh, always gathering a lot of atten attention. So people who already know Sneer, they come to us for these AMA sessions, some contests, and trying to win this, as we said, lottery tickets for new uh, tokens. And again, again, as, as you understand, uh, this is uh, rewards ca comes from the ecosystem. We are not paying a, a penny for this. Uh, 
another stuff, we are making full tutorials about how to participate in some interesting projects, say why, how to become whitelisted on NFT uh, giveaways, some uh, testnet stuff, uh, for example, near crowd. Uh, we distribute a lot of invites to near crowd with tutorial how to work with this pro system. Uh, we had uh, we distributed a lot of Aurora Plus, in Plus invites to influencers and our active members. We had some activities with uh, Spin, with uh, Sender. Uh, during the Stater uh, Guild Wars, we got first place. It was first AMA with the new, my new wallet team in the new ecosystem. So just a lot of projects are coming uh, to get this attention of uh, those and thousands of uh, people. Another stuff what I want to share with you, we made this NFT for our near native community. So we are just give away it for free uh, to winner of contests, events, uh, hackathons, some quizzes. So if people show that they are good enough, they know something about near, we are happy to give our NFT. Uh, and uh, this NFT is tradable. It can be uh, sold on a marketplace. Or it can be hold it and the uh, holder of NFT uh, participate in continuous some giveaways or invites share distribution, whitelist distribution, and we are uh, we will enable para staking very soon for the uh, for for the holders of NFT. Uh, so so again, some ecosystem partners give uh, some uh, rewards for our activities, and we are share it to the best guys through the NFT. Uh, distribution. So I think it's it's interesting approach and just use it if you like. So it's, it's much more simple to just give free NFT instead of giving some uh, liquid tokens which will be sold immediately on exchange. We support a lot of other community, mostly Ukrainian, uh, which are having uh, Ukrainian language in chats, near UA, near UA guild. Uh, we have uh, we are maintaining new games, uh, supporting them with uh, reports of their activities, and uh, stake wars channel for the last uh, activity. Okay, some uh, uh, if some if we maybe this YouTube video uh, is viewed by uh, near channel uh, applications building on near, you can come to us and um, we can help you with uh, media coverage. Uh, I'll prepare some activities for you. And this is a uh, contacts of guys. Okay, probably I will share link to this uh, presentation. We have community members, we have translator, translators, we have moderators, and uh, that's what we are doing for uh, pushing New York ecosystem in our region. Okay, I have two minutes. If you have any questions, I can uh, can cover them. Thank you. Okay, so probably next, next, I'm finished then. Hello everybody and thank you so much. We're going to be taking a short break and we will be back at 1.35 with our next presentation, The Graph, How to Build Subgraphs on Near with Simon Schmidt. Thank you so much.
Yeah. Oh, nice. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes? Nice. I like the setup, actually, with those headphones. It's a cool idea. Otherwise, those conferences are so loud all the time, like everybody's kind of speaking and shouting, and you have those, this, this AV stuff. So, hi. Um, my name is um, Simon Emanuel Schmidt. I'm a solutions engineer at Edge Node working on the graph protocol. And um, yeah, my, I was starting working in blockchain in 2017, working for a DeFi protocol. The graph was not around and uh, leading the front end team and was really always running into the problems of getting data from the blockchain. It's horrible, right? I mean, like we have this huge blockchain and, uh, and there's this data and it's all in the same pot somehow and it's so hard to get it out and to, to bring it to a front end in an efficient way. And um, then at some point I discovered that there is actually a solution to this problem and it's called the graph. 
right? And, uh, and, and then um, I wanted to actually work with it. But the graph is not so interesting. Oh, yeah. Per, per se, um, when we are in the near, near ecosystem. So the good news is like, there is the graph integration with the near actually since one year. So since one year, you can build subgraphs on near. It was announced at last NearCon, also actually here in Lisbon. Um, so so that, that is possible. So this relationship began very early. And it's not only that um, you can use subgraphs on NIR, it is also that NIR was the first non-EVM compatible blockchain that was integrated into the graph. Other blockchains followed, like RVF and, um, and Cosmos right now. We're working on Polkadot and uh, Solana integration, but, but NIR was the first one. And, and NIR is also a dead blockchain with, with an exciting technology when it comes about kind of making it easy for users, making it fast, having a good onboarding experience. And I think the graph is like a crucial part in, in, in that journey, especially for Web2 developers, because in the end, what, what, what you can have for your dApps and for your smart contracts on NIR is a very neat graphical interface. But we'll look into this uh, in late, later slides, right? Um, so how a quick refresher of how is data stored in a smart contract. So, like when you look at the CryptoPunks, but like, uh, as an example, um, it's basically just, you can think about, it's a table, and it's a static table that you see the current state. You see in this table, like, who owns which punk right now. And that data is easily queryable, and you can, you can do these contract calls and, and, and get it out. But what about the provenance? Who had it before? And what was the price? How did the price develop of that certain NFT over time? That's, th that's data that you not easily can query the, the blockchain for. In order to get to that data, you would need to go through uh, all the transactions in the blockchain and, and filter out the ones that are interesting for you and, and kind of store that somewhere, right? So what we, what we want to have is kind of this time machine thing, right? So we can, we can um, we can travel back in time and see like how did the state of my contract actually develop over time. And if you want to do this, um, then you come up in the end with a complex indexing solution. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and there are different ones. It can be, it can be quite complex, um, but uh, we dive into it a little bit more now. So the problem with data on the blockchain, you can, you can see it um, as, as the following. So initially, um, blockchain in, in ventures, you know, like the, the, they were very like decentralization maximalist, uh, and um, which is still, still something I think it's cool, right? And the idea was like to have a user interface deployed somewhere on a decentralized data uh, system, like IPFS, for example. Uh, so that consists of HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript, and it directly communicates with a blockchain. That in the best case, you run some light client or or full node on your, on your computer. So you're kind of like completely free for, from all the dependencies from any centralized ent entry point. That, that was the initial idea. It turns out that the blockchains, and uh, that applies to, to Ethereum, but also to NIR, they are primarily designed for writing. So you have an incentivization me mechanism for writing, right? You pay, you pay transaction fees so that the validators actually include your uh, your transaction into the blockchain, and that's how it works. But there is no incentive at all to actually provide you then that data. And that, that's a huge problem. And um, so, so in the end, you come up with, with weird stuff like, you know, for the JavaScript developers amongst us, like you, you, you do, you, you call a contract, you, you, then you, usually you call a centralized uh, JSON RPC provider who provides you that data, then you wait until you get that data into the front end, and then you have the first step, and then you do the next, okay, how many NFTs do you have? And then you need to loop through them, and again, you send queries, you wait for them, and then, and so on and so forth. And like, this code, if it runs, and you, you own maybe like 10 to 20 NFTs on that contract, um, and every of these calls takes maybe, I don't know, 200 milliseconds, you're quickly in, in a front end that waits two to three, uh, no, 10 to 20 to 30 seconds just to display your NFTs, right? I mean, like, when we think about user experiences, like nowadays, uh, a page should load in 200, 300, maybe 500 milliseconds at max. After that, you, you lose the user. They're like, maybe something is wrong. Like, if I wait five seconds on a page, and then I, then I think, like, maybe the page is broken. Can I call support? Um, so how should then a modern DAP architecture look like? 
So um, what, what, what we are proposing here, or what the graph protocol actually is, is kind of this indexing protocol that lives between the user interface and the blockchain, which then for you indexes exactly that data that you need in your front end in a way that you can query it then. Um, and that's, that's true. I mean, the graph exists, as I said, like the Ethereum and all EVM compatible chains, but also near. Obviously, Aurora, which is also an EVM compatible chain, is, is, is available, and we will dive into it how to do this later. Um, yes, yeah, so in the end, you come up with this very neat GraphQL query. So who, who, who of you knows GraphQL? Please raise your hands. Yeah. Who knows Rust? Ah, nice. Okay, we have a good Rust community here. Who knows um, WebAssembly or Assembly Script? Assembly Script? Yeah. Okay, cool. Nice. Then uh, who loves JavaScript? Love, love. <laughs> All right. Okay. So for the Rust people amongst here, I see we have a good amount of Rust people. So the graph node is written in Rust. And we also recently launched uh, this new technology called the substreams, which I'm not going into it in this talk, but it's so something that you might want to look, look into, that you write like paralliz parallelizable indexing uh, mechanism in Rust. So this is actually very cool, and we hope we can bring the substreams also soon to near. Um, but until then, there is this... Um, there is a preview, a technological preview that you can try out. It's, it's pretty cool. We were able to kind of increase indexing speeds to 100x from the current um, uh, serial processing that's done with uh, assembly script. Like you write the subgraphs in assembly script. We have, look, we have a look at that later. Um, yeah, let's move on. So GraphQL that we have. So as I said, the graph, can, can we say like this API for vibrant decentralized future. We want to build this together. Like Nier wants to build this. The graph wants to build this. I think that's why we are all here. Um, currently on the, on the hosted service, which is a centralized proof of concept, we have one billion queries per day. So like big names like uh, Uniswap or Audios using the, uh, the, the, the hosted service or also the decentralized network. And also like one example that I want to highlight here from the NIR ecosystem is the linear protocol, this liquid staking protocol on NIR. Um, they wrote a very good subgraph and that they really did some great work of, of how can the graph be used on NIR. Uh, I have links in my presentation, which I will tweet later, um, where, where you can see how they did it. They have like a great tutorial. Um, yeah, that's the graph. Um, so also there is this decentralized in, in the, uh, this indexing network protocol. We announced the sunsetting of the hosted service. Um, disclaimer here, we will never kind of stop something working on the hosted service that does not work on the decentralized network. And with NIR, there, 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 we, are, we are now starting to talk like how we do decentralized NIR indexing, but until then, be rest assured that uh, your subgraph will running on the hosted service. But like the decentralized network is nice, we have like 180 indexes worldwide, they are individuals, um, they are not really associated with, with, with uh, the, the graph or graph foundation, we have a redundancy, uh, they are cheap, fast, cheap, reliable, and um, yeah, so we're working towards this global open API where all data is available and accessible in a, in a, in a, in a way, and you have like dApps that are never shut down by a centralized entity because they want to change their API or change their business model, right? Um, moving on. So you have these truly decentralized dApps. Um, but yeah, wait. Um, so the graph is nice and stuff, but like on... There is on near is this near indexer, right? So, so, so what is the near indexer, and why should I, should you use the graph uh, when there is this near indexer? Um, so this is the meme. <laughs> so I know like a lot of near people started to use the near indexer, but there is problems with the near in in indexer. I mean, you have raw access to SQL. You can send queries there. What you have there is kind of raw, this raw storage of data. But what you want what you want to have in your DAP is actually kind of a dedicated schema a dedicated um, uh, database for you that, that serves your use case and is not generalistic. And the graph actually uses the near indexer under the hood. We look later on into the system architecture. Um, and subgraphs, so why should you use then the, 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 the graph? Like subgraphs are a battle-tested industry standard. As I said, like there are one billion queries per day on the hosted service. Like there is a huge amount of subgraphs uh, from a lot of DeFi protocols, from a lot of different chains, which, which all use kind of these open source standards. You can define and fill your own database schema. So you can come up and say whatever you do. Like I talked with people, they want to do I know, fractionalized uh, ownership of, of real estate, and then you can come up, oh, okay, I have owners, I have real estate, I have fractions, and then you define it so that it makes sense for your application and, uh, and can, can really have the best of it. 
then you can also adhere to the standard. So for example, uh, Messari, the recent addition of uh, the graph uh, CoreDev that was announced uh, two, two months ago, they started to write schemas for different verticals like uh, AMMs, landing protocols, uh, and so on and so forth that all adhere to the same schema. So you, if, you have, if you're in one of those verticals and you want to be integrated with Messari, you can reach out to them and, and work with them together so that your subgraph adheres to their schema so that their data um, intelligence on top of subgraphs can, can also create the data that you have. That's very cool. And in the end, like I love GraphQL, and uh, having a GraphQL API for your, uh, for your dApp is very cool. So this is how it looks. Um, on top, we have the user interface. Again, like HTML, CSS, we, we know that. And then we have the graph that you query via GraphQL. The graph gets its data from, a, from the near indexer uh, with, with, with uh, SQL. And then the near indexer somehow gets its data out from the near blockchain with JSON RPC, or I don't know actually how, how this is done. But um, you, you see in the end, kind of this, re this reminds of a traditional uh, full stack application. We have a front end, you have GraphQL, you have a database, and you have a server somewhere in between. But this is kind of the decentralized future. Um, yeah, so this is existing infrastructure, so you don't need to care about this, right? So you write a subgraph, you, you uh, publish it, uh, you deploy it to the, to the hosted service, and boom, it works, right? Um, so what, we, what I love to think about this approach is this standing on the shoulders, shoulders of giants, right? So you can think about the graph and near as giants, and so you as a developer, you're kind of leveraging what's existing there to build your, your amazing experience for your users. You don't need to reinvent the wheel and, and, and write your own index so that you need to run on a centralized server that might go down or whatever, or be censored or whatever. So you can just use it. And so in the end, we have F3, which the idea is to have no centralized servers, right? Cool. So far, cool, right? Subgraphs, nice. Um, so how does it actually look like? Um, I wanted to do a live demo, but um, my computer is a little bit uh, uh, in strike. But uh, I, I talked with you through the concepts, and uh, later on I will get it display again my Twitter. And you can always DM me if you have questions how to write a subgraph, or, or uh, if you want to do it, and we can look at this. But um, yeah, so what is a subgraph? You can think about the subgraph is actually, as I said, on top, it's, a da it's, a, it's really a database that you write the schema for it, how you want to have your data stored and accessible. And then you have, um, on, the, on the right side, you have um, the blockchain. And then you have these mappings that, that you say, OK, I'm watching the blockchain for stuff that's happening. On, on, on near, you, you, you're watching those transaction receipts, these receipts. And, and, and for a certain contract, we look in this later. And then whenever they come, you trigger a so-called mapping, which starts to unpack what's going on, reads into the database what we already have, and starts to update the database. The sky is the limit. You can do whatever you want. But this is roughly how it works. You define a schema, and you define how you want to scrape data from the blockchain and store into the database schema. Then in the end, what happens, like all these transactions, which are otherwise um, unordered just on top of each other, are nicely um, kind of ordered by the subgraphs into, into databases that um, provide you the data um, neatly organized. So <laughs> this is maybe how it looks like live, right? So you have kind of this this uh, yeah, mess of different uh, transactions. And then in the end, you end up with magically sorted um, s uh, d data per, per, uh, per subgraph. So this is how it works. On top, you have the DAP. And then you have the smart contracts on chain. You send transactions to the smart contracts, which emit events or transactions, uh, receipts, whatever goes into the graph node. The graph node um, runs some mappings, which is a WASM module. Theoretically, for the Rust people here, you could, you could write those modules in Rust, because in the end, it compiles to WebAssembly, right? Um, yes. Then you run that, put it into a store. And on, on the left side, we have uh, the DAP that, that queries, uh, goes through the GraphQL uh, interface, which again gets routed to the graph node and, and gets resolved across, uh, according to what data that you have uh, there. All right, so near subgraph development in general, going back to the NFT example, so like the question is like how many, you need to think about like which are the questions that my front end has. So for, for NFTs, which is simple, like how many NFTs are there in total? How many NFTs have this trade? Who owns what? Who owned it before? What is the price? What is the historic price? 
and so on and so forth. So best is kind of quickly have an idea about like what data that do, do I want to get started. And, and then from that, you derive the schema. And in the, in the schema, you say like, yeah, okay, we have the contract, which represents the collection. Contract has an address, or in, a, in, in near it's an account. Then you have counts, you have owners, you have and, um, and so on. You have like uh, single accounts, and you have the NFTs, which are the actual token. There you have the token ID, maybe some metadata associated with it, trades if you have them. Um, you can also store, store the events, or what, what's going on with the NFT. So this is for the NFT, but obviously for your DAP, you will come up with a different schema that better suits your purpose. Um, <clears throat> so you could scan the QR code, which links to the presentation, so you have uh, all this information again. I will also tweet that later on, um, but that's maybe something that you want to do. Right, I think we have it. Cool. Um, so the steps, basically, you install the dependencies. Everything, the only thing that you need is like a Node.js environment on your computer, and then you install the graph CLI. <coughs> And then you need to know which contract, so you can go, you, so you probably know for your own stuff, but if you want to write a subgraph for something else, then you go to the, to the near block explorer and, and start to find the, the, this account name. Um, we will look at that later. Then you initialize the subgraph with a command that um, we show later. You need to set the start block. That's something that the, the initial command does not do automatically. Um, and then you could actually, you could, what you can do then is just already deploy that subgraph to the hosted service because it already does something. If you do this, you have kind of an example entity that gets just like all the receipts somehow stored, very raw, but you can also deploy it. And that, for me, it's always important when I start to play around with new tech, I want to have a quick success, right? It's so, it's so hard and there are so many nuances, but like by following these simple steps that I also show you a screenshot later on, you just have like a quick win and say like, oh, nice, okay, I now have a subgraph and it's on the hosted service, it runs, you see it, how it indexes, you can already query the GraphQL interface. <coughs> and um, yeah, and, and then it's, it's fun. And then you see like, okay, maybe I should um, do more stuff. I want to have like this data order organized, I, I want to parse this better. And then you iterate and iterate and iterate uh, until you have really a cool subgraph that, 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 gives you the, that serves your purpose. So um, <coughs> this would be the steps. So you just run graph in it, that's it, you don't need to do more. Then you first you select uh, which protocol, so obviously this is near in this time. Then you give the subgraph name, which is uh, your GitHub username slash um, the, the name of your subgraph. Um, then you can create, you choose a directory, uh, then which network, you can near mainnet or near testnet. Um, you, you set the contract account and the contract name and boom, it works. And then. Uh, you, you end up with, with the subgraph again. You have the subgraph YAML, the schema, and the mappings. Here, quick screenshots. This is the subgraph, the, the manifest, the subgraph YAML. It defines like uh, which account do we watch, which, which blockchain, and so on, and which are the, 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 where is the schema, and where is the mapping. Then you have a schema that's kind of in GraphQL where you just define a database. And, um, and then mappings, which are triggered for all the receipts that are happening on that uh, contract. And then in the end, you can uh, deploy it to the hosted service, and then you see already this is indexing. I had a test with these misfits, <coughs> NFTs, and also you can send these queries, and then you see already what's going on, and you can play around. Um, yeah, I have some resources here. So you scan the thing that you can follow up. Um, yeah. Next, we, we want to really better integrate with the existing de dev tools, Reen, Pagoda, the docs, etc. Some validators should become graph indexers, and then we decentralize. Thank you so much. Uh, here is uh, also QR code with stuff in the graph ecosystem. We have like network roles, community, you can get engaged. Um, thank you for your time, and I will tweet that presentation later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you. All right, that was absolutely wonderful. Super informative. I'm really excited about the graph on Near, particularly because it's built in Rust, and Rust is one of my favorite programming languages. I was sitting right there, and he was asking what technologies we all used, and I was just getting so excited. WebAssembly, AssemblyScript, Rust, even JavaScript, because, you know, uh, Near just 
released our uh, brand new JavaScript SDK. So you can now build smart contracts in JavaScript as well. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, uh, let me just remind you about the Telegram chat. If you go to nearcon.org, you can click on the nav bar. You can uh, go to the Telegram chat and communicate with all the other attendees here and get help if you need it. So uh, we do have over 2,000 attendees here at NearCon. Lots of friends to be made. All right, our next speaker is going to be talking about Flux on the power of cross-chain oracles. Jasper. Hey, how's it going? Thank you. Mic check. Can you hear me all right? Cool. All right. Today I'll be introducing the next version of uh, Flux Protocol. Uh, to get started, can I get a raise of hands of people that don't know what an oracle does? Cool. So an oracle could be summarized as a data bridge. It allows smart contracts to access data outside of the regular smart contract environment. Usually this would be like price feeds, for example, for like lending protocols or I don't know, you can get creative with it. You can query weather data or whatever. But it, it's basically a way to query um, yeah, data that lives outside of the blockchain. So a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I joined uh, crypto, sort of like started working full time in crypto uh, late 2017. Um, initially, I was doing layer two scalability research for Ethereum, working on Plasma. Uh, eventually, that rolled into rollups. I started building products in the space. So, uh, built multiple products on ETH, multiple products on NIR. And uh, yeah, we've been building on NIR since 2019. So, our Oracle, we designed with the following core principles in mind. First of all, it needs to be fast. That means that the throughput of the Oracle needs to be fast. So the time between the issuance of a data request and the uh, data request being answered needs to be as short as possible to enable many use cases while remaining secure. So uh, the security is important because the data that is being generated by these, uh, by these oracles and being consumed by these protocols actually has a lot of impact. If you prov provide incorrect data to, for example, a lending protocol or a um, stablecoin, you can create uh, bad backing, bad debt. There's all of these like security uh, issues that could arise if you use bad data or an Oracle would be attacked. Um, this is also where the decentralization and permissionlessness comes in. It is very important, in our opinion, for an Oracle to actually be truly decentralized. We'll get to that in the next slide. Um, and we also build it multi-chain natively. So this means that the goal of what we're trying to build here is I've been calling the HTTP for Web3. We want to build the true data standard for querying real-world data from any blockchain. Um, and we want to make it highly programmable. So we have something we call Flux VM, which allows you to perform certain mutations on data off-chain, which can save you a bunch of computational power and allows you to be more sort of like lenient in what you can do with the data um, or, or what, like the type of data that you can actually query. So we believe that decentralizing the data bridge or the oracles is the last frontier to enable truly decentralized applications, uh, mostly DeFi applications actually. Currently we think, we are of the belief that many of the things that have been branded as DeFi are more so democratized finance than they are truly decentralized because many of them are still built on like um, centralized data bridges or oracles. Um, as a user, this means that, or as a token holder, this means that you do have complete oversight and insight in how the protocol works, who's interacting with it, so it's transparent. You might even have some influence on some DAO parameters that you can set or uh, code upgrades or some decision making, but that doesn't mean that the entire network has to be uh, yeah, it's decentralized as well. And um, yeah, it's important. It's important because the data providers actually hold a lot of power. The oracles hold a lot of power, more power than most people realize. If you're using a lending protocol that uses a centralized oracle, 
in essence, you're giving custody to this oracle because this oracle has the ability to remove all funds, uh, all funds from the network just by providing an incorrect price for a certain assets, for example. So yeah, we are of the belief that uh, insufficiently decentralized oracles create single points of failures and actually add custody back into DeFi, which is, to me, one of the biggest selling points of DeFi is like truly being your own bank and truly owning the assets uh, based on certain logic that you expect to happen. Decentralization matters. It's uh, within Oracle, somehow it's gotten a little bit controversial to say. Um, censorship is rampant. We're seeing it with the Tornado Cash events that happened like a few, what is it, like two months ago, a month ago? There were Oracles that were considering not providing data to certain addresses that were blacklisted. There was uh, Oracles being set up to blacklist certain accounts from using certain protocols. Um, it's a good way of sort of like re-sparking some philosophical ideas like why are we here in the first place, in my opinion. Um, and the goal is to shift custodianship back to the user, like I said, like remove as many single points of failure from DeFi as we can. Um, and allowing the querying of like more broad data. Uh, with a lot of the oracles that are out there today, it is a whitelisted set of validators that provides data on a whitelisted a group of assets from a bunch of a couple of sources. Um, we want to broaden that up, so allow you to query any public data, while at the same time also onboarding uh, private data providers into our network that can, can also be queried through our network. So, what are the type of use cases that an oracle like this would enable? So, the most obvious one is just secure data querying, right? Like it's the most on the nose use case that uh, we see today. It is, I want to know the price of ETH from my smart contract, so I'm going to query one or a bunch of sources to provide me with the price of ETH. Simple. It gets a little bit more abstract when you add off-chain computation into the mix. So when you issue a data request on Flux, you'll be able to uh, add a bunch of um, opcodes or execution code to be then executed by our validators on the, uh, on the sources that you provide. So not only will you be able to query a bunch of sources, but then there's a bunch of computation that you can do with, on the data before it actually comes on chain. Um, a use case that is interested in this, for example, we're working with this protocol called Volts. They're doing um, interest rate swaps, and they need to build like, a pretty expensive algorithm to compute um, some, something like the, the median of 20 uh, um, APYs that are being generated by certain protocols, which is too expensive to do on chain. So now they have to batch it up in like 20 different calls, which is obviously not very efficient. Uh, and then the, the final use case, which might be a little bit less obvious, but still cool, it's cross-chain uh, communication. Uh, using our network, you'll be able to query the network state of other chains um, using either RPCs or other API endpoints. And essentially, this would allow you to do um, cross-chain swaps, maybe yeah, just generalized cross-chain messaging and bridging, for example. So how, what does this look like, a protocol like this, like a fully decentralized Oracle? What, what are we talking about here? So on top of everything, there's the sources. We do not own the sources, obviously. It's like a separate part of our, um, it's, it's separate external to our network, but it's very important. Uh, these sources are queried by our data request consensus layer. Uh, the data request consensus layer just queries the data, gets to consensus, and then posts it on the main chain. The main chain in this case is a near shard. So we're, we're building uh, some of our networks done on, uh, some of our networks built on near. Uh, the main chain is responsible as a checkpointing and uh, value transmission system, I think is the best way to put it. So if you want to participate in a network, you need to stake Flux tokens. You will stake those on NIR. Uh, there's new rewards, like in the form of inflationary tokens that are being minted there. Tokens are burned there. And slashing happens as well uh, on this layer next to like checkpointing. Um, then we have the subchain bridging network. The subchain bridging web network is there to notify the uh, data request consensus layer of newly re uh, created requests and also to relay the outcomes of the data requests back to each of the subchains. 
uh, subchains we call just basically any layer one that queries uh, that uh, has protocols querying our data. So it could be Ethereum, could be Aurora, could be Near, any any chain basically. And then the relayers um, I might touch on if I have time after the next section. So what is the flow of a data request from issuance to um, finalization? First of all, we need a validator set in order to get a, a group of validators that can perform the, our consensus. Um, so that basically means that there is a group of validators staking on near. The next thing that would happen is that the data request is issued on the subchain. Uh, at issuance, it has multiple parameters, but let's just go with a Wasm hash that links to some bytecode that needs to be executed and uh, a list of sources that need to be queried. Our subchain validator network then picks up this request and provides it to the uh, consensus layer with some stake. And the stake is there so that they cannot create a bunch of fake requests. So it's a way to go uh, to co counteract uh, denial of service attacks. The next thing that would happen is that a subset of our main validator set gets picked and they are elected to perform the consensus on the outcome of the data request. And this is done in the form of a commit reveal scheme. So the uh, validators query the source, they compute the outcome based on the code that was provided by the uh, request issuer. They then uh, come to an outcome to that request, hash it, commit it, the leader collects them. The next uh, phase is that the commits are revealed and collected again by the leader. Following that, the leader uses an aggregate function in order to get to the final outcome. This aggregate function is also um, picked. It has, there will be default one, but it is essentially meant to be picked by the request um, issuer. So the protocol can pick like how they want their final outcome to be computed. This could be like, do they want outliers to be removed? Do they want to average it? Do they want a median value? It really depends on the use case. So yeah, that's uh, how the final outcome gets uh, generated. Next step is that the leader then takes this final outcome and posts it on the main chain where it is batched. A batch could be compared to a block in a blockchain. It is a uh, epochal sort of like event in which a bunch of uh, data requests get batched together. It's to just save computation. Uh, the epoch in which a batch gets posted to each of the subchains is programmable. So that's like a DAO, um, DAO parameter. So for one chain that is very expensive, it could take like, it could be that we push a batch every minute, where for another chain that's less expensive, we push a batch every 10 seconds, basically. So once the epoch is finished, a Merkle root is generated. Uh, so all of the outcomes to all of the data requests are put into a Merkle tree. And uh, this Merkle root is then signed by our uh, validator network. Then our subchain validators take this Merkle root and the signed version of it and provide it to the subchain's Oracle contract where it can be verified. So within the Oracle contract, it can be verified that the batch was in fact signed off by our entire validator network and um, yeah, that is, that's essentially puts the data on chain. So from that point on, anybody that queried the data is able to uh, prove that the outcome to a certain data request was X, Y, Z. Uh, we have some services in place to make that easier, but essentially this is the main progress uh, process. I made it, I still have time to touch on relayers. That's cool. So relayers essentially are there as a backstop uh, for data, uh, data requests. And the reason why we need three relayers is because Oracle finality and blockchain finality are slightly different things. If there is an attack on a blockchain network, there can be a social consensus to roll back the chain to a state previously, which makes it less attractive to attack a blockchain network. Or you can have reorgs like we see it every day on like Polygon and stuff. There's tons of reorgs in order because of like there might be some uh, issues with their uh, consensus. Where in an, or in an Oracle network, if I am a protocol that chooses to consume data from a certain Oracle like Flux, um, 
and that data, if Flux gets attacked and we provide incorrect data, there's not going to be a reorg on his chain because like our uh, network messed up, right? So it is important to have like these fallback mechanisms. So what we do is we have a relayer, which is essentially a very similar to one of our validator nodes. It runs, it is, what? As you issue a data request, you're able to s select a relayer to run the request in parallel and provide the outcome with our consensus network. And then you can use that in order to anchor the, um, anchor the outcome of the uh, Flux Oracle. So let's say our Oracle gets to a price of ETH of like $1,100, and the relayer that you select gets to a price of $1,200. You can see that it's off by a certain percentage that is either within or without your threshold, and then you can choose to act on that. Because apparently there's some sort of volati volatility going on in the market, or there's an attack on the network, or the relayer is being um, compromised. So you can choose to either pause your protocol or just ignore the request and reissue it. But the idea is that um, it is used to, uh, yeah, as a backstop, basically. That's my time. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, I'll be right outside. Come, uh, come tap me on the shoulder. All right, Jasper, thank you so much. That was a great thing to learn about. Oracles have always been something that I thought was super interesting because it's always like, oh, we have this Web3 thing, but it always seems so disconnected from Web2, right? Because everything's always in, siloed in Web3. How do we get the stuff from Web2 into Web3, right? It's always uh, really cool to see how Flux Protocol is making that happen. All right. Um, Quick reminder, at 3.30 to 5 on the Nightshade stage, we're going to have some investors who are going to hear from near builders and give them feedback live. Uh, to me, it sounds a little bit like a Shark Tank style uh, panel, so make sure to check that out. Also, hashtag NearCon2022 is trending on Twitter. Yay. So keep it up, everybody. Uh, <laughs> that's just amazing. All right, next up we have, can Nier make blockchain gaming click? All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, guys. Uh, thumbs up if you can hear me well. Perfect. Thank you, guys. OK, so today's subject is about, uh, so can Nier protocol can make blockchain gaming click? Just as a side note, uh, so you know a bit who am I. Uh, so my name is Killian. I'm working as a software engineer at Ledger uh, for one year now. And I'm uh, part of both those communities, like blockchain and gaming. Like, just as I said, I'm part of Ledger. And for the gaming part, I've been part of a gaming community and especially the game dev community uh, since I was 13 years old. Uh, like, I started uh, hacking games, creating games. Uh, this is what made me today a software engineer. So I'm glad for it. And in my opinion, uh, there is a gap to, be, to, to bridge between those two communities. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So uh, if, we're to if we're talking about blockchain gaming, I think at least one of those names are going to come to your mind. Uh, Axie Infinity, uh, The Sandbox, The Central End, those are big names in the blockchain gaming industry. And in my opinion, uh, some of these games embodies well the issues we have today with blockchain gaming. Um, keep in mind that those, those opinions are my own, not ledgers. I'm talking uh, here as part of both the blockchain and gaming community member. Uh, so here are, the, in my opinion, uh, the issues we have today with blockchain gaming. The first one is false premises and unachievable roadmaps. Uh, this is something that a lot of uh, blockchain game surfers today uh, they uh, overpromise and underdeliver. Um, but this is not something that only the blockchain games are guilty about. Like we can find this same uh, thing in regular games. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember uh, what happened with No Man's Sky, uh, a game from Hello Games. Uh, so the game director like promised a lot of stuff. Like the game was, was going to be uh, massively multiplayer. Uh, the game was going to have thousands of weapons and everything, a lot, a lot and a lot of promise. And when, when the game 
was finally released, uh, the players were extremely disappointed, not because the game was so bad, but because the difference between what was promised and what was delivered was huge. Uh, and I think that's something that occurs a lot with blockchain games. The next point is about hacks and cheats. Um, so this is two different points. Uh, hacks are more, about, uh, are more like when a smart contract gets hacked or something like this. This is something that happens, for example, with Axie Infinity. There was a, a, a leak of, I think, more than $60 million uh, due to, to a hack. So whenever uh, a hack happens on regular games, like the worst thing that can happen is like you use your game accounts or you use like very worst case scenarios, like you lose your password and it gets lit. But in blockchain gaming, like getting a hack means losing your funds, and that's much more critical in my opinion. And that's why uh, this uh, blockchain gaming ecosystem attracts more hackers. And that's the, exactly the same thing with cheats, really, because uh, if hackers are motivated enough uh, to create bots and cheats just for the sake of ruining other players' experience, why wouldn't they do it when, when they get ruins your experience and get your money? Like, uh, bots and cheats give you an unfair advantage, and that means you can get more money or even steal money from other players. Uh, the next one is the lack of gameplay. Like, on the play-to-earn play games, uh, a lot of games focus on the earn parts. Like, they're working a lot of, on tokenomics, marketing, but not a lot on the play part. Like, building an actual a fun gameplay loop. Like, a lot of games are just looks like a really simple game that could be uh, have done in a three days hackathon. Uh, of course, you've got a lot of marketing behind and tokenomics, but the, the, the gameplay loop uh, is too simple, in my opinion. Uh, the next point is about speculation and predatory monetization scheme. So, uh, in the gaming community, uh, especially the PC gaming community, players are really afraid of predatory monetization schemes. Uh, just as an example, so I'm a huge Overwatch player, so I've been playing the game since day one. And uh, I don't know if you guys know, but in uh, one month, Overwatch 2 is getting released. And uh, there was a leak uh, from the dev team where basically you will have to pay new heroes uh, through battle passes. And there was a, large, uh, a huge outburst of a community. Uh, if you want to check out like the uh, uh, Overwatch subreddits, like all players are losing their shit right now because um, having to pay for heroes means that pay players paying will have an advantage over player not paying. And uh, that's something like that the PC gaming community hates as a whole. And uh, blockchain games are often really about speculation and like paying more give you an unfair advantage. And this is something that doesn't fit well with the PC gaming community. The next thing I like to talk about is uh, fake ownership. Like uh, one thing, like one of the major points of blockchain gaming is, is like, your game items are your NFTs, you own them, the game developer can't remove it from you. But the thing is, I think it's partly a lie because yes, you actually own the blood of metadata, that is your NFT, like you own maybe an ID, 1234, which represents Blade of Doom in the game, or you actually own maybe the metadata of the item, like the name, the attack point, stuff like that. But in the end, the game developer is the one that decides of the value of your item. Maybe in the next release, they will really super Blade of Doom, which is Twice, uh, twice as much better and uh, more strong, stronger, everything. And in the end, like the game developer decides of the value of your item because the value of your item is directly correlated to its utility in game. So yes, you own the NFT, but you don't control the value of it. This is something that is often uh, misunderstood in the gaming in, uh, industry. And all that, all that, those points below, uh, above, uh, leads to a really bad reputation of blockchain in gaming. Uh, like, blockchain is almost a bad word in, uh, in the PC gaming community. I'm not talking about all gaming communities because a gaming community is not a big community, but rather a small community, like you've got VR community, you've got mobile gaming community, console gaming, PC gaming. I'm more talking here about the game dev and PC gaming community, which I'm part of. Um, as, as an example, for example, for bad reputation, Steam, the biggest PC uh, selling uh, game platform, has just outright banned all games containing blockchain elements and NFTs. Like, if you're a game developer uh, wanting to, to publish your game on Steam, you can't. And that means you will probably lose like 50% of your revenues. And that's huge. Uh, another example is like Joseph Schaeffer, a huge uh, influential uh, personality in the gaming community. Like, he made uh, a, he's part of the it, it Takes Two game, award winning game that was released this year. Uh, just, I would say, I'd rather shoot myself in the knee 
uh, rather than putting NFTs in any of my game. But that's to show how bad the reputation of blockchain is in gaming, uh, PC gaming industry, industry. So that's a lot of pessimism to start with. Uh, let's try to be a bit more optimistic and see what the blockchain could really be used for in, uh, in gaming. Uh, so those, those are, in my opinion, what really matters and uh, that's what blockchain can do best. The first thing is about funding modders and more especially funding the community around games because um, if you take some games like Skyrim, Minecraft, Gary's Mood, uh, Blade and Sorcery, Terraria, those are huge games with a huge communities. Skyrim was released, I think, like 10 years ago. That's a lot of time for a game. Um, and there is no next uh, episode for now. Like, we don't know when uh, The Elder Scrolls 6 is going to release. But Skyrim, Skyrim is still here and kicking. Like, the community around it is still creating mods. And that's what's uh, making the game live today. Because there is a, a community so active releasing content uh, every day. Uh, and this is what blockchain could do, like creating an healthy environment when modders can get paid for the content uh, they are creating for the community, like getting back from the community. Um, and often modders are miners, uh, like there's a lot of uh, kids that started programming with Minecraft, creating super cool mods. And modders often have to stop modding when they get in the active life because they don't have the time to have a full-time job and continue modding full-time. So we see a lot of modders disappeared around the age of 23 something because they have to leave, they have to get a job and they can't continue living off making mods because it's free. And blockchain here could enable communities to reward the content creators. Um, the next point is permissionless payment method because there is a lot of place in the world that relies uh, exclusively on piracy to get games. Like they can't pay for games even if they wanted to because they don't have a, a proper credit card system that allows for paying online or stuff like that. Uh, it's not even a question of price because usually uh, games are priced differently per uh, country, like games on Russia or India are often much cheaper than uh, games in uh, France or uh, UK, stuff like that. Uh, so blockchain here could enable um, parts of the world to join the proper gaming community, like joining online games where you have to pay for getting into, into the servers and they can't pay because they don't have proper credit card system here with blockchain, they could actually pay for it and join an online community uh, and, and they can't really right now. The next point is a trusted server called execution. So this is kind of a niche use case here because uh, this is where, for example, a developer says you've got one person chance to get Blade of Doom in my game, a uh, super cool weapon. But how can you trust the developer that you actually have one person chance? You can't. But here with smart contracts, you could ask, uh, the developer could uh, have a transparency and say, you can check here, you can actually have one person chance of getting the Blade of Doom. Uh, the next point is free infrastructure for games. Once again, it's kind of a niche scenario, but like uh, today there's a lot of games uh, with uh, still a small but really active community and the servers get uh, removed because the, the, the game is not getting, getting funds enough for the developer to pay for the servers. And here what we could do with blockchain is um, if the game could be hosted on, as a smart contract, like for example, um, Cars game like Earthstone, which are uh, turn by turn, so one second block finality time is enough for this kind of games. Uh, we could host them as smart contracts and as long as the community is willing to pay for the server fees, like the, the, the transaction fees, the game will be alive forever as it's living on blockchain. I mean, as long as the blockchain is up, of course. Uh, and the next point, which is also a really important point and less niche this time, is player governance. Like, um, player governance uh, would, be, would allow players to decide how they want to, a game to evolve, and especially early access game. There's a lot of early access games being released by indie, indie developers today. Uh, and indie there's something that all, sometimes happens, and it's really bad, like it's when uh, an indie developer releases an early access game, which means it's unfinished. Like they are releasing it early for getting funds, uh, being able to continue with development. But sometimes the game just gets dropped by the developer. Like he got the found and it just flies away with the money, and the, the community is not getting what they wanted in the game. And DAO could uh, somehow solve this problem. Like uh, the early access game, the base game, like an unfinished game, you're, you're paying less for it. And then there is a DAO behind it where players can put funds where, where they want the features. Like, I don't know, uh, you want a dinosaur in the game? Right, you pay $2, $2 for it, you, you put in the dinosaur funds, and if a developer actually implements dinosaurs in the game, then is getting the money 
that all the players paid for this feature and that would allow incremental uh, development of uh, early access games uh, funded by the community for the community with a healthy and trustful uh, environment and ecosystem. So this is all what blockchain could uh, do for games and now let's talk a bit more specifically about how Nier could be the best gaming platform. Because I think Nier has all the chances uh, to become a de facto and started gaming platform. It's carbon neutral which is uh, very important to the gaming uh, community. Uh, it has fast block finality, awesome dev, do awesome dev tools, uh, so easy for devs to, to get started with, uh, and awesome tooling like uh, automatic, like human readable uh, addresses, which could almost be used as uh, your game identifier. So a lot of good things going for Nier, and uh, how can Nier push things forward and try to get invested into the gaming community. So those are, in my opinion, uh, good starting points. So the first point would be like curation of gaming projects, because I know there's uh, gaming projects that uh, are already on Nier. And I think Nier should act as kind of a judge to uh, promote uh, promising projects and to try to hide away a scam projects, like really trying to get involved with the development of games to see what are our projects that are worthy and what projects are just scams or cash grabs and trying to regulate all the ecosystem to gain trust from everyone. Uh, the next point is an easy way to pay creators, modders, active community members. Uh, this is what we talked about, like uh, getting money back to the modders. Uh, so maybe the near uh, community could build some tools to be able to uh, distribute funds to, to modders, community members. Uh, this is about like building tools to, to enable that. The next point is uh, an easy to use, cheap and serverless game data services. So I don't know if you watched the uh, Pagoda confer conference like was uh, one hour ago, uh, where on Pagoda console you could just deploy like easily an NFT system. I think we could uh, also have a lot of services that are useful for games like such as scoreboards. Instead of just creating an account on AWS, creating an EC2 instance, uh, having to create your scoreboard API with Python or whatever, uh, here you could just one click and deploy your scoreboard. Uh, you just put some parameters like I want uh, uh, to limit the max maximum score to be that much. Uh, player can have one or multiple entries. Like the guy configure the scoreboard however he wants and it get deployed on the blockchain and acts as a server, game server. Or more like game tool. Scoreboard is kind of a separate part from the actual game but it could be useful for that. Uh, the next part is like sponsorship, sponsorship of existing game, game dev projects. So this is more about gaining trust of the game dev industry because in the end, the game dev, uh, game dev community is the gateway uh, to the gaming, game, gaming world. This is the very one to implement the actual technologies and stuff. And I think you can try to get invested, uh, so in sponsoring either uh, in terms of uh, financial, financial help or uh, advising how to get started, uh, stuff like this and uh, it will really help to gain trust from the game dev industry. And the final point is the near integration in game engines because of course people are going to choose what's available uh, as tooling. Like, I don't know, like I'm a developer, maybe I only know about Ethereum, I want to try web free development on Unity because I only know Unity. Uh, and here I, I try to see and there is no Unity, uh, Ethereum plugin on Unity, but I see that there's a near plugin and so maybe I will get started with that and then it's gonna make me choose Nier as with all my projects because it's available. It's uh, free, cheap, accessible. There's good tooling around it. So tooling is key for getting Nier onboarded in the gaming community. And that's why I created Nier Toolbox, which is a C++ SDK for Nier. Uh, it's available on GitHub. I will show the URL later, but like it's on uh, github.com, Sigma Nier Toolbox. So what is Nier Toolbox? It's uh, first and only open source because I know there's some closed source C++ SDK uh, for Near Protocol, which also includes a C interface for easy integration. Um, it supports Ledger hardware wallets. I'm, I mean, of course, I'm from Ledger, so I'm going to have this feature. Uh, it supports smart contract interaction, so you can either call or view uh, things from smart contracts, which allow you to integrate, like I said before, scoreboards, for example, but there's a lot of use case. Uh, it's easily embeddable in software, game engines, everything. Uh, it's cross-platform, it works on Windows, Linux, uh, Mac OS. It should work on Android and iOS, didn't test it yet, but should work. And uh, easy integration with other languages which uh, interoperate well with C++ such as Lua or C Sharp. 
And that leads to the last point, uh, also in his integration with game engines. And this is why now it's near as compatible with Unity. So Unity has been used to create games like or in the Blind Forest, uh, Cuphead, Fall Guys, Hearthstone, Pokemon Go, I think you know some of those titles. Uh, this is what the integration looks like, so I don't know if the code looks shit on the screen, by some kind of reflection, but uh, you can see the code is pretty short, so this is kind of a low-level uh, framework. You can build high-level stuff on top of it that will come soon, but that's just to show how easy is it. Uh, how easy is it. Uh, you just have to drag and drop the DLL into, inside your project, uh, declare your functions, and then you can just use them. And that's it. You can transfer money, you can do everything you want. Uh, so this is not the best interface so far, but it's going to get improved, before, of course. Uh, that means also Nier is now compatible with Unreal Engine, so which is responsible for uh, creating games like Fortnite. Uh, it was used for Street Fighter V, Sea of Thieves, lots of games, really. And this is the interface for near, uh, Unreal Engine. It's a bit simpler because Unreal Engine is already C++, so, so you're able to use uh, the actual uh, C++ library directly in Unreal Engine. Uh, so this is how simple it is, really. You just have to create your client, specify the network, your private key. There's, there are also going to be uh, login, with, uh, webs uh, login with your browser, don't worry. Uh, but meanwhile, you can put your private key or an access key. Uh, here, uh, you can transfer funds, you can do contract calls, uh, contract view, you can uh, deploy smart contract, like the whole uh, SDK is available uh, on Unreal, and that also means that it com it's compatible with Blueprint, Blueprint, sorry, like you can just drag and drop boxes like uh, transfer funds, call smart contracts, so even someone that doesn't uh, actually know programming can use near integration super easily. That means near is now also compatible with Godot. I mean, all those integrations were actually created. Like, for Unity, I didn't know shit about Unity. The integration took me, like, two hours in an airport to create. So, not that bad. So, for Godot, you just have to create a near client wrapper node. You drag and drop it into your scene. Uh, and then you can just do near client login, near client transfer. You can transfer for it again. You can call smart contracts. It's really super easy and simple. I wanted the SDK to be as simple as possible. Even if you don't know much about near, you can use it. You can start to transfer funds uh, and call smart contracts. And that means also near is uh, compatible with the best, uh, most performant, most beautiful game engine, which is, uh, I don't say that because I created it. There is no bias here. Uh, and that also means like Nier is compatible with almost every other engine on Earth because most engines uh, give uh, are either coded in C++ directly or allow for C++ integration. That means if you use default Lumberyard, the game engine from Amazon uh, used to create Star Citizen, for example, Solar 2D, which was called Cor uh, Corona Engine before, strangely they changed the name, uh, Love 2D, Game Maker Studio, and even lower level frameworks like SFML or, or SDL. Uh, of course, like the SDK was created like 10, 10 days ago, so it's pretty new, uh, a bit rough about around the edges. Uh, but of course, I will take time to improve it. If you guys have any feature requests, uh, I'd be glad to, to hear from you if you guys want to, cheat, to chat after the uh, after, after conference. Uh, but uh, this is uh, what I uh, already plan to improve, like uh, being able to log in with your browser uh, directly, just like the near CLI. You just uh, are on the game homepage. Login with Nier, where is your, already your username, you are able to transfer and call smart contract directly from the game. Uh, synchronous and asynchronous support, so far there is synchronous support, I'm building the asynchronous support for uh, game engine that does not support uh, threading out of the box. Uh, higher level abstraction, just as you show on Unity, the, uh, the interface was a bit rough, I plan on improving that. And lastly, more engine integration, like uh, the one I showed uh, earlier, like uh, um, S uh, default and everything. Uh, I think that's it. If you have questions, I'm just going to put back the link if you are curious guys about it. I want to check it out. It's uh, available right here. Uh, I think we got one minute if you guys got any questions. Otherwise, uh, it was a pleasure to, to speak with you guys. Uh, don't stay if you want to chat uh, after, uh, with me after the conference. Uh, if you've got any features you want into the SDK, if you didn't agree about, about what I said, I'd be super curious about knowing your opinion about blockchain and gaming. Uh, so thanks a lot, guys, for your attention, and uh, thank you all. Thank you so much, Kellyanne. Woo!
Woo, how about that? Making it super easy to develop high quality video games using the near blockchain and other super popular game engines. All right. Thank you so much. Next up, we have a Web3 approach to video conferencing from Enrique Correa da Silva. Is that yes, correct? I yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'm curious about discussing uh, with you. Uh... We all mic'd up? I'm, I think I mic'd up already. Oh, hold on. Let me just put this in here. Thank you. Thank what, you so much. Which one's the clicker? This one? Next and back, right? That's it. What time is it? Uh, we have four minutes. Where's the watch? Huh? Oh, there. Okay. Oh, we started already. I thought it was at 40. Okay. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, coming to hear our talk. I'm uh, Enrique Correa da Silva, co-founder and CTO of Relays. We're building um, a hyper-secure communications platform, and we're using near blockchain for that. So a little bit about myself, uh, who I am, or who, I am, who am I? I've done a lot of things. I'm a former firefighter, journalist, diplomat, intelligence, law enforcement officer for Portuguese government. So I'm a Portuguese. I'm Portuguese, although I have an English uh, American accent. I've been fascinated by crypto for a long time. Uh, got in about a decade ago. Not just uh, the technology, but also what I think is going to—it's revolutionary aspect, which I think is going to change our world. I started playing with uh, Prodigy Online back in the 1980s. For those of us who remember the BBS world, so I guess I'm showing them a bit of a dinosaur. And that's how I got interested in computers. Uh, my background is actually in political science and economics, and it's not a technical background. Um, then I, I co-founded uh, Privis, which is a secure Swiss company that does secure communications for governments uh, all over the world, including here in Portugal. Uh, I also founded, and I'm the president of the Instituto New Economy, which is a Portuguese think tank where a lot of the people here are actually members. Uh, so Brave, Near, Immunify, Balancer, some of the big projects uh, from not just Portugal, but from the whole international crypto space, but with the connection in Portugal, they're all members of uh, this institute. And we just announced uh, actually a federation. We just associated with the other two crypto associations in Portugal, APBC, Associação Portuguesa de Blockchain e Criptomoeda, and all Alliance for Blockchain, which is another uh, another association. So we all got together, and we we're basically talking to the government uh, to sit, make them understand this technology and maintain Portugal as a crypto hub. That's the goal. I guess, as I said, uh, I think you know blockchain technology isn't shouldn't be just about the financial aspect, which we all know with Bitcoin, and I'm a big Bitcoin believer but I'm not a maximalist. Uh, I, I love Bitcoin, but I also love other technologies. And I think Near and other, um, other layer ones, for example, are going to be very promising. So I think this is going to change the way the world works, right? If you think about it, the 20th century all, and all the past centuries, we've always been dependent on analog, what I call analog centralized authorities, be it you know, your teachers, the government, police, banks, Etc. And I think that's changing, and it's been changing for a while. And I think blockchain technology is part of the, the solution to that problem. So the fact that we can trust mathematics instead of a, a person is, I think, game-changing. And not just in finance, but as you'll see also in our, in our case for secure communications. So now I'm, I'm, I'm the founder or co-founder and CTO of Relays. Okay, what is Relays? What are we trying to do here? Um, if you can, you can see on the slide, but I'll just go over it really quickly. So the idea is we're based on WebRTC technology, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you guys know. So everything we do, by the way, is open source, and it, it will be open source. We, or we, have, we haven't released all the code yet, but we will be releasing, because one, that's one of the things we believe in, is that to be able to do this and have people trust you, everything needs to be open source, right? So our whole ethos comes from the crypto community, from the cypherpunk community, I guess, would be a good way to explain it. Everything needs to be open source. Everything needs to be auditable. And so you don't have to trust, you know, minimize basically the trust services, whether it's us, whether it's, you know, some protocol, whether it's some infrastructure provider, Cloudflare, whatever. Everything needs to be minimized in the trust aspect. And so we use WebRTC, which is a great technology, um, but it's got some problems, and we try to solve some of those problems. So one of the things we, the problems we have with WebRTC, as you probably all know, is that its security model is dependent on um, some kind of central authority. 
right? The certificate authority, which is great if you trust, you know, if you ever go into your computer and you look at all the certificate authorities that your computer trusts by default, you'll probably be surprised to see that there's some countries or some institutes from officially, from official government agencies in countries which you would probably not want to place your trust in. And all of those companies can sign a certificate and your browser will trust a certificate. So even if you use a WebRTC encrypted system, you have no real idea of if you're being monitored or not because a sophisticated global threat adversary, three letter word agencies, not just Western, but also from East, from North, from South, they have the technology and they can do that, right? So that's a big problem. We're trying to change that with blockchain. Um, so we have privacy focus. We don't, we use a browser based. Uh, in fact, the browser I recommend for everyone to use, we use all the time is Brave. So we work inside Brave browser, for example, and Chrome and Chromium, Opera, Firefox, even Safari, Edge, but I recommend Brave for obvious reasons. Um, so the, the fact that you don't have to download anything, right, even from a sysadmin security standpoint is fantastic because if you don't have to download anything, no Zoom client, no you know, Teams meeting, whatever binary you're going to run on your network, that's not a good idea. Anyone here who's in cybersecurity knows that usually makes the, uh, the chief security officer his hair rise every time somebody wants to install something in the corporate land. Well, browsers, we all have browsers already, right? So everyone has a browser installed on their desktop. It's already authorized to use you know, ports 80 and 443, so they can go out through the firewall. So it makes sense to build uh, a communication system on something that you don't have to install anything. So and you'll see it's already working. You just have to open a link with your browser and you can start doing encrypted video conferencing without having to install anything. Um, the quality is excellent, as you'll see. Uh, we use simulcast, so we use you know, different layers. We have congestion algorithms. Uh, and if you actually use it, and some of the people here have used it, we're coming out of beta testing soon. So, but some people here have used it already, and the quality is, in my, in my uh, view, much better than the centralized versions. Um, we're gonna, and we're gonna, so for this, we're going to use a decentralized identity in the sense that you already have an authentication, right? We're, all, we're using your wallet, whether it's on Near, whether it's an Ethereum wallet, whether it's Solana, it doesn't really matter. You're already authenticated uh, by, use, by, by the virtue of using a wallet. So you already have the authentication. So you already own your identity. In the future, when, with partners that we're looking into, is to be able to have people sign claims about that identity. So you'll be able to use, let's say, your, let's say you use a, a, a near at wallet called, you know, 123. So you could use 123.near, that's your wallet, that's your main identity, that's your public identity. You could have that signed then by others from a kind of the web of trust, from the PGP circle web of trust type thing. So social, uh, you know, their social network will say, yeah, that's Enrique or that's Michael. And that's your public persona. Then you will be able to have NFTs attached to it and all that kind of stuff. So basically when you log into your wallet, you can start a conference with anyone in the world and people are sure that they're talking to you and there's no man in the middle, no impersonation. Um, you know, and that's why we're using blockchain technology. It's a very important thing here is people say, well, why another, why, why another token, you know? Why use blockchain? Well, we already, blockchain to me, I'm, I'm a big cybersecurity guy and I like the security aspects. And I've always been fascinated by the fact that the blockchain, and in, my, in the case of the Bitcoin network, is the most secure network in the world. And I've had this argument with many people, you know, especially from governments who don't understand this, and they always think it can be hacked because, oh, you know, for most lay, lay people who don't understand technology and don't understand the cryptoverse, they think anything can be hacked. Well, as I tell the politicians all the time, you know, there's a $1 trillion bounty publicly available. So if you can hack it, go ahead. You'll become rich. Of course, no one does. But this is to say that we already have, you know, the example of Bitcoin, what Bitcoin did for money is kind of what we want to do now for communications. Um, so we have authentication with no passwords or logins. Uh, I don't know, I don't think we have a, a shot, but if you guys can check it out at uh, www.relays.io, you'll see a little place where it says start meeting. You can already ch check it out because it's open right now. So it's not, you don't have to log in with your wallet. You can still use it. Um, and then interesting part here is, you know, why are we using all this? What's, what's cool about this? Well, we're using smart, smart contracts in this case uh, to negotiate the end-to-end -end encryption key. So we actually use two double-layer encryption in, um, in Relays. We have the, the first hop-by-hop -hop DTLS SRTP encryption, which is the, the WebRTC security stack, which you guys are all familiar with. But on top of that, because for the reasons I said earlier, that is, it is secure, but it's not end-to-end -end encrypted, and it's not bulletproof or hyper-secure. The only way to make it hyper-secure is to make sure that you can have um, a trusted anchor. So we use blockchain as a trusted anchor 
where then the, where, where then the encryption keys for the session get negotiated. Each time somebody joins a session, they will their wallet will interact with the smart contract and with others who are also joining the session, and they will negotiate a temporary ephemeral session key using the OLM, OLM protocol. For those who don't know what you know, OLM is, OLM is a European fork of the signal protocol, so the double ratchet protocol. It's very, very much the same idea, right? So you get a master key, then it ratchets, ratchets it, and it's good for multi-party chat, because basically Relays is a multi-party video chat with end-to-end -end encryption through the blockchain, All right? Um, so we take away the man-in-the-middle threat from uh, rogue nodes, too, since we have end-to-end -end encryption. We're gonna, we'll talk about the nodes in a second. Nodes are what miners would be, I guess, in, a, in the Relays network, so instead of doing you know, POW, proof of work, or proof of whatever, mining, in our case, we're going to give nodes, we want our community to run nodes where they give bandwidth, what we call nodes or video bridges to the, to the Relays network. And there's a very good reason for that. That's not a gimmick. It's because the more decentralized you are, it means you become uncensorable. So eventually, the, when we have enough people running nodes and getting rewarded in Relay tokens for providing their bandwidth, someone, let's say, behind the Great Firewall in China who wants to connect, and he can't, because let's, you know, let's, let's just say that a bunch of the nodes that we have, have been, are being blocked by the Chinese firewall. Well, if you have more and more nodes popping up all over the place, resident, even residential computers, all you need basically is bandwidth, right? It's not uh, CPU intensive because the node is just a dumb relay. It just grabs encrypted packets from one side and sends them out the other side. It can't look into the packets, so it can't do DPI. It, can't, you know, it can sniff, but it's just, it's just going to get a TCP dump of encrypted PCAP you know, with double encryption, DTLSS RTP, and then the end-to-end -end encryption on top. So we think that's a good way to do it. Um, Post-quantum, some people have asked me about post-quantum, uh, and actually an interesting, well, I don't have much time, because I want to give you guys time for questions. Quick story on post-quantum, we're very, uh, I'm, I was a big believer, still am, but we'll see, on the NIST uh, post-quantum uh, selection strategy. And one of the protocols we were looking into is uh, SIDH, which is actually, ironically, put out by Microsoft, uh, but it's open source, obviously. And it's based on the, let me see if I can get this, uh, the, the bad word right, super singular iso iso isogeny, so which is complicated mathematics, basically. But it's, it's one of the contenders, or it was, because apparently two weeks ago, there's been some news about that. So it's an evolving field for those who follow post-quantum cr cryptography. For us, the important thing is we, we'll be able to just plug and play and switch our primitives. And eventually, when we settle on a, on a real post-quantum or quantum-resistant uh, algorithm, we, we want to be ready to just switch around, you know, so we, we'll use, we're using RSA, diffie hellman all that stuff, which, as you know, asymmetric cryptography is vulnerable to quantum computers. If we have a key negotiation mechanism, which is um, quantum proof or quantum resistant, and then we use AES-256 for the symmetric encryption key, then I don't care how powerful a threat adversary you are, even with quantum computers, you won't be able to, to crack the encryption. But that's in the future. Um, so, this is very important. The, the tokenization and incentivization of the nodes uh, is crucial for our project, and it's not a gimmick. Uh, just a quick story, a couple years ago, I was, I, during the ICO craze in 2017, along with some of other people here, I was about to launch a distributed VPN, or ADAPT DVPN. Um, it was called Privum at the time. So we did everything, got everything ready, and of course, timing is everything. And when we were ready to launch, it was 2018, Crypto Winter came in, and so at the last minute, we stopped. We decided not to do it. That's the bad news. The good news is that gave us a lot of background and it actually allowed us to see what other players in the space are doing. You know, there's Mysterium, there's Orchid, there's other uh, players doing the same kind of thing. And in, this, in a sense, it's very similar in the sense that they also use uh, nodes for their token to, to expand the network. We want to do the same thing. Uh, if you think about Tor, for example, you have no incentivization to run Tor exit nodes. So the people who run Tor exit nodes, they do it either because they're malicious, they're a foreign intelligence service, and that's a reality, and or they're very uh, altruistic, which is great, but doesn't scale well, right, and it's a threat. If you incentivize people to actually run their own nodes and they get paid for that, they incentivize, then that makes it, it changes the whole ballgame, basically. And um, we also, we obviously, we don't, you know, so our, our business model is the opposite of Web2. We don't log anything, we don't, you know, we don't want your metadata, no signups, no passwords, no emails, none of that stuff. And like I said, you can choose to have different identities on the blockchain. You can have your real ID, which is verified by others with a decentralized identity, so people know they're talking to you, but you can also have another wallet that you use for earlier, more anonymous communications. For, you know, it'll work the same. And that's just the beginning, right? So the idea, once we have this protocol uh, and the whole layer of the infrastructure running, we're starting with video conferencing because it's cool and we believe it's, impo it's important because we're getting into a centralized dystopian future where everything 
is, is becoming more and more censored. And we are firm believers that if you don't have a way, an uncensorable, uncontrollable, uh, de decentralized form of communication that even governments, powerful governments, can't stop, then at sooner or later we're going to have problems, right? We're going to have all these closed silos, which we already do. And I don't want to talk, you know, about the Web 2 competition, but we all know, you know, the problems with Zoom and uh, Google and Microsoft's meeting and all the other Web 2 centralized models where, as you know, they collect all your data. Our, our model's the opposite. And so we'll start with the video conferencing, but we have other goodies in the bag and partnerships. We're in, uh, actually talking to a couple of big players here, which I can't reveal yet, to have partnerships with uh, some of the others that we're building on the near ecosystem. Uh, but we'll, we'll hear about that more soon. Oh, there we go. And why we're building on near? So we looked at a bunch of blockchains uh, last year. We were looking at Solana, and I don't want to call out you know, any names here. We looked at a bunch of different ones. Ethereum would be you know, the, 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 easy, the easy win or the easy pick, but of course with Ethereum and its, you know, the, I guess the scalability and the speed, we'll see how, how, how things go after the merge. But you know, until now, and we couldn't wait for the ever coming merge that was never happening. So we decided to, swi to switch to Nier um, for many reasons. First, I really like the fact that they support smart contracts in Rust, which is as you guys, the geeks here know, it's a memory safe language. Um, then we can also port all the contracts to other EVMs. To, to EVM. So we'll start with Near, and Near is already working, where we have a proof of concept running on the, on the blockchain. But then we're going to move to others, right? Or I'm not going to say which ones now, but you know, Ethereum compatible um, blockchains. The idea is to have a, a multi-chain protocol, but we're starting with Near. Uh, a lot of the team here, the Near team is in Lisbon. We know a lot of the guys. Uh, we got to know them even more and more uh, le re uh, recently. A lot of our developers are Ukrainian, so the people who are working with us are actually, a lot of them come from, uh, are actually in Ukraine at the moment. So we have a multinational team um, and we get along very well. I think the mindset and the quality, as you all know, the quality of uh, you know, Ukrainian engineers uh, is fantastic. So why not? Why not do it? And since, since they're here, we're here, I'm Portuguese. I want the Portuguese crypto hub to, to grow. That's the idea. So that's why we chose Nier. But you know, there's the technology, which I, you guys, everyone's discussed already, you know, the finality, the block time, uh, the sharding, all that kind of stuff, which I won't get into because that's, that's a diff different conversation. And okay, so the token gives you access to the platform. It'll, it'll be run uh, to running nodes, incentivize the end, uh, nodes to be run. Which basically, and the way, the way we protect against that, we're gonna, you're gonna have to stake a little bit of Relay tokens to run a node. And that's in case you're malicious, if you're starting to do intercepts, man in the middle or whatever. So let's say you're a foreign intelligence service trying to bring us down it'll become expensive. So that's the idea of the staking model. And then the more your node gets used, and at the end of each call, you'll be able to report the quality of the node. So we'll have like a node reputation scoring on the blockchain. So the best nodes will get pushed to the top and they'll get a lot, and they'll get a lot of traffic. The bad malicious nodes, they'll still be registered on the blockchain, but nobody will use them because our, our algorithm will just say this is bad. And then with the Relight token, we're gonna have you know, more things coming in the future, all the kind of premium enterprise type stuff. Uh, and for that, you're going to have to use Relay tokens to pay for that. So the roadmap, uh, this has been a, you know, an ongoing project in our, in Fernando, our CEO is here, and I have you know, been friends for a while. We've done blockchain projects in the past. We've been talking about this for, I don't know, for three, four years now. And then we finally decided last year, all right, uh, or two years ago, let's get this started. Let's get it done. So right now, like I said, if you guys go, you can check it out. We already have an um, you know, open page that you can use. It's already working. But now we're, we're, we're accelerating all the different moving parts. So there's a bunch of new moving parts that are, are need to be done. We hope to have, uh, you can use it now. It's already running on the test net. So don't worry, none of you, we won't take any of your tokens. Uh, it's just for fun. Um, by the end of the year, we want to have the TGE. And that's going to depend on how quickly we get the test net and the nodes running, uh, but also on the market conditions, obviously. Oh, I realize we're running out of time and I want to give some time for questions. You can, read the, you can read the map and if you have questions, ask me later. I wanted to open it up for questions because we're running out of time. So that's it. Questions? I think you need a microphone. Actually, oh, got one. And sorry if that was quick, guys. Uh, <laughs> I know it's a bit fast. A lot of lot of info to put through. Thank you. Um, what about competitors, and how are you nuanced differently? Well, competitors. There's only one competitor that we know of. Uh, competitor in the sense that they're doing video conferencing on uh, Web3. It's called Huddle, I think. We looked into their. There's. It's completely different. They're not going for security and privacy. They're going for NFTs, which we'll also support. So they're going after easy to use NFTs, but it's all centralized. So if you actually go, and what little source code they have available, you'll notice it's all being run through AWS in the states. 
There's no end-to-end -end encryption. So there's a, a bunch of different you know, uh, technical factors that differentiate ourselves from them, which is fine. You know, they're not necessarily competitors. They're different market niches. Some people don't care about privacy and security. They want you know, nice little avatars, which we, already, we all have too, but it you know, depends on what you want, basically. Anybody else? 30 seconds? Um, in terms of competition with Web2, um, like Zoom, do you foresee a significant uh, stealing of market share over time? Do you think consumers would actually care? Um, I think they're not, they don't care about us right now because we're you know, a small startup and not on the ecosystem. As this grows and you know, it's going very well and we've had some good, good talks, I think, yeah, they, we will become competitors to them. They won't like it which is why it's important to also have everything in the community. So even if it could be competitor as in, as in a commercial competitor, but could also be, let's say, a government you know, agency. Let's say you're in some certain parts of the world and the government doesn't want you to use this because they can't decrypt it, right? They can't stop it, and they don't like you communicating. Well, if we're decentralized, uh, eventually we want to move into the DAO model you know, in the future, and it's owned by the community, much like you know, m many of the best uh, crypto projects out there, then I don't, the competition won't be able to do anything. Or, and or governments won't be able to do anything. If they want, they can change their model. We think this is the future, right? As you guys know, Web 2, Web 3 switches the model. Uh, we don't need your data. There's no reason for Zoom or Microsoft or Google to collect all those analytics, even if they don't see the content of the conference. Even if you believe in that, let's say we trust you know, their assertions. There's no way for you to verify, but let's trust that. They're still collecting all the analytics, all the metadata, you know, who's talking to who, where you're from, what you're doing, blah, 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 et cetera. A lot of them, I think the free version of Zoom, they even can mine their chats for advertisement and stuff. That's the opposite of what we want. You know, we want to build a Web3, and this is real Web3 application that's working, it's available, it's not vaporware, and it's not related to swaps and finance, and, you know, which is fine, nothing wrong with that. But I thought it was time for to, do, to go into other parts of the stack, not just the financial aspect, but security, privacy, and communications. Don't forget, com free communications is the cornerstone of freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is the cornerstone of democracy. If you get, you know, if you get rid of one of those, then we don't really have a true democracy, right? You're gonna have silos where cancel culture and all kinds of uh, you know, pressures will basically silence people, and we're against that. And I guess I'm over time already, sorry. Unless, one more question or, no? We, we have time for more no? questions. Okay. No, no more questions? Excellent. Well, thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it, and use it. Give us feedback. Oh, one thing. Anyway, technical guy, we're recruiting. We're getting technical, not just technical, but any, any engineers who are passionate about open source and this kind of stuff I talked about and like near, hit us up. We're always recruiting and we're expanding quickly. We have a lot of, a lot of work to do and a lot of challenges to uh, overcome, but we love this community. So spread the word. If you want to do it yourself or if you have friends who are interested in this, we're hiring. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Enrique. All right, perfect. Well, what a great project they're working on here. It's, you know, like I, like I mentioned before, sometimes it's difficult to see how the, all the services we see on Web 2 can move over to Web 3. And this is an example of a project that is bringing what, you know, we all kind of expect a Web 2 project to be bringing that all over into Web3. We now have a 15-minute break, so we'll be coming back at 3.15. Um, but make sure to come back here, absolutely, for our Solidity for Near discussion from Aurora Labs. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Doom Slug stage. Now we have Arto Bendikin here with us. He's from Aurora Labs. He's going to be talking about Solidity for Near. Arto, take it away. Yes. Hello. Sound check, sound check. Okay. Uh, let me find my clicker. Can we, can we go to the slides, please? All right. So today's talk is going to be somewhat technical, but I'll take it um, easy. Uh, I think it will be of interest even to people who 
might not uh, follow the technical details. Uh, so we're going to talk about a research uh, project that we've uh, completed recently at Aurora. Um, we, we have been working for a long time on performance improvements uh, for our Ethereum virtual machine. So in case uh, somebody doesn't know what Aurora is, Aurora is an Ethereum uh, virtual machine EVM layered on top of the NIR protocol. And we are the, the um, only such EVM at this time. Um, the layering looks like this. Um, technically, it makes Aurora an L2 on top of the NIR protocol. Uh, it means that uh, users send us EVM transactions and we um, interpret those transactions using the near runtime, which is written in WebAssembly. Web um, users consume EVM gas and we consume near gas, which is a tricky relationship. Uh, technically speaking, uh, your Solidity contract goes through a lot of layers in order to be executed. The, the first layer is uh, Sputnik VM, which is the um, EVM implementation from Parity on top of which we build. So we have something called Aurora Engine, which effectively marries Sputnik VM as the virtual machine uh, with the Aurora runtime, uh, where we have uh, facilities like custom um, uh, precompiles that allow you to, to interoperate with the Rainbow Bridge and, and the like. Um, after we interpret uh, your EVM bytecode, um, the interpreter itself uh, sits on a layer, uh, uh, layer of WebAssembly. Uh, the WebAssembly um, code itself is effectively interpreted or rather just in time compiled down to x86 machine code by the near runtime. And then of course, um, at the lowest level, even CPUs these days um, have a JIT, a just-in-time uh, compiler of sorts, uh, compiling x86 down into very risky-looking uh, microcode. So there's, there's a lot of uh, layers where we lose performance. And this talk is about um, what are the performance gains that we could achieve on Aurora. So if you look back at the last year, which has been the first year of Aurora, Aurora spun off as a uh, standalone company from NIR in uh, June, July 2021. Uh, in, in the year since then, uh, we've, uh, we've worked a lot on performance. When we, when we got started, uh, we were not able to run most um, EVM contracts, most Solidity contracts, because the, the uh, ceiling we had a hard ceiling from how much EVM gas um, a contract could consume before we aborted its execution. And over the past year, we've uh, raised this ceiling uh, through many, many, many um, initiatives, both at NIR, um, our uh, former colleagues at NIR, and also at Aurora, and also we contributed to Sputnik VM, the EVM project that I, that I mentioned, uh, which is uh, hosted by Parity. Uh, here, here we have some of the improvements we've, we've done, but of course the, the list is very much longer. And through these improvements, in the last year, we managed to raise the EVM gas ceiling, the hard limit for which contracts you can execute on Aurora, which you cannot, by about 11 times. So that means that we've uh, gone from uh, a gas limit of uh, 150,000 um, EVM gas, which is ultimately the unit that um, somebody utilizing an EVM such as Aurora uh, will care about. The, the near gas that we consume under the hood is quite hidden from the user. Um, so we've gone from 150K uh, to, what is it, 1.7 million is the, is the current uh, uh, typical, typical gas limit for um, an EVM uh, solidity contract on, on Aurora. So that's, that's pretty decent. Um, that's allowed, uh, let's say, about 80% of the um, solidity Ethereum uh, use cases to run on Aurora and hence near. Um, so that's not bad, but uh, it's nowhere near um, being able to achieve 100% of the use cases. So Ethereum itself has a gas limit in excess of 15, 15 million gas, 
which would be another 10x from this. Uh, and they keep raising it upwards. Uh, so we, we're chasing a bit of a moving, moving target there. Um, before I go on, I want to give a shout out to uh, the people at Aurora and Near who made this happen, the, the previous 11x happen. Um, we've, we've gotten a lot of support from Near. Um, the contract runtime team at Near uh, have, for the past uh, half a year plus, uh, worked intensively on analyzing and uh, remedying uh, matters uh, so that Aurora um, can, can have a higher EVM um, gas ceiling. Um, now, the, the good news is, is um, that we have indeed raised the glass ceiling by 11x. The, the bad news is that uh, we are running out of headroom. There's, there's not that much more we can do. We've, uh, we've picked uh, all the low-hanging fruit. Uh, there's, um, um, there's only so much more we can do. And uh, this is a, what we call a gas profile uh, prepared by, by my colleague uh, Michael. Um, this, this shows the breakdown from uh, um, typical, typical transactions on Aurora. So, oops, the uh, successful transactions. Um, what, what, what are the different categories that uh, gas will be consumed in? And as you can see, the categories are very much like a computer. You know, we have storage, we have memory, um, and then we have CPU, which is the uh, web assembly instructions, WASM instructions. Um, and it's like a computer because it is a virtual computer, of course. Um, so when we, when we began uh, more than a year ago, uh, this looked quite different. The, the big green part, the, the WASM instructions, was uh, tiny, 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 uh, because it was being, um, it, in proportion to the, to the rest of the categories, um, there was just much more work elsewhere to optimize before we managed to get around to, to looking at the, the big green bar. But at this stage, as you see, uh, WASM is beginning to, so WebAssembly, that's the abbreviation for WebAssembly, uh, that's beginning to dominate. That category is now substantial. Um, previously, storage was the biggest problem. Storage was very, very expensive, so storage access uh, accounted for much of the gas use um, a year ago and during the last year. But uh, with the, our colleagues at NIR, we pretty much solved that. Storage is, I wouldn't say that it's reached the final state, but it's, uh, it's looking pretty much uh, okay at this point. And so that means that now it makes sense for us to focus also, also on the CPU category, so the WebAssembly instructions. And uh, this is actually uh, a sort of average case from uh, a lot of um, ordinary contracts, but then we also have gas guzzling contracts. So here is a little bit of a different profile for the most expensive transactions uh, that are executed on Aurora, so within this uh, sampling period. Um, and here you see that the situation is uh, even more pronounced. The CPU category, WASM instructions, is almost 60%. And that means that uh, really it makes sense for us to turn, turn our attention now to, to this category. And that's what we've done over the last quarter. Uh, so given that we are running out of uh, headroom in uh, how much more the near runtime can be optimized, uh, how much more the storage access can be optimized, um, we, we began to consider that perhaps it would make sense to, instead of interpreting EVM bytecode, we might compile EVM bytecode to WebAssembly. And this is, of course, not a new idea. Um, we, we often joke that uh, Aurora is something like S2.0, as in the original vision of S2.0, which since then has been descoped, and there will never be an S2.0 as such, as in not, not named as such. Um, but uh, Aurora and Near actually fulfill many of the um, original points about S2.0, whether we're talking about sharding or whether, whether we are indeed talking about um, compiling EVM bytecode to, to WebAssembly. Um, so the Ethereum Foundation for a long time funded uh, work to compile EVM bytecode to WebAssembly, but that, uh, that work has uh, been discontinued as, as many, many uh, priorities have shifted with uh, S2.0, so-called. However, with, with Aurora, we've uh, tackled this. So let me, let me give a little bit of an example of what we are talking about here. So on the left side here, we have 
solidity. We have a very simple basic solidity contract. You could even call it a hello world of, of uh, smart contracts. It's a counter contract where you have a persistent uh, uh, counter value and you have uh, public methods to increment it, decrement it and to get the current value. Super simple. And on the right side we have uh, the EVM bytecode for one of the methods for increment. And this is uh, uh, actually, uh, an, let's say, an optimal version of increment. The actual version produced by Solidity is about three, four times longer. But never mind, this, uh, this illustrates what actually is needed to implement that method. Um, and it's not uh, a whole lot of code, but that, there you see what does EVM bytecode look like. It's a, the EVM is a stack machine, which means that you, uh, you have an operand stack where you push values and you pop values and you uh, operate on the values on the stack. So for example, to, to um, add two numbers, you would put those numbers on the stack and then you would call add, and add would take two numbers off the stack, um, add them together and put the result on the stack. So it's a really, really simple uh, machine, unlike uh, uh, real computers. Um, now, how do we go from this to, to WebAssembly? Uh, that's not so, sim not, not so difficult in the, uh, let's say, the naive way of doing it. So what we can do is we, uh, in, in this case, we have on the left side the EVM bytecode. On the right side, we have equivalent Rust code, so written, written in the uh, primary language for writing near, near contracts. And uh, this is just a conceptual example. We don't actually compile EVM bytecode to Rust. We compile directly to WebAssembly. But conceptually, it works like this that um, the very simplest way to translate EVM bytecode um, is just to consider that every opcode, so every instruction in the EVM uh, instruction set becomes a, a function that you can call. And you just uh, transliterate the whole bytecode. You have to take care of control structures like loops and uh, branches, as in if statements. But other than that, it's, it's kind of trivial. So there you see how it's done. Um, and this, this slide shows uh, the resulting WebAssembly. So this is the textual form of web, WebAssembly, and you can see that it's, it's pretty simple. So this is how you can translate um, to WebAssembly from EVM. And indeed, so this, this is what we've done. Um, our interest in this project is, of course, about utilizing this for a speed up in Aurora. But that's down the road, because we, we are going to have to collaborate with our colleagues at NIR. Uh, in order to um, implement some protocol changes, near protocol changes, that will support this endeavor. And that's a long-term project that will take at least six months, if you can even convince them that it's a worthwhile uh, thing to do. Um, so in the, in the meantime, as we pursue uh, that process, which is a process, um, we've, we've uh, come up with a, a research prototype that I call EVM to near. And this is a compiler that is available on GitHub. I hope that somebody flipped the um, repo to public during this talk. Um, it's a, currently a, a prototype, but it's getting pretty close to being generally usable. So EVM to near ingests um, either Solidity contracts or even EVM bytecode directly. And it outputs uh, a WebAssembly file, which you can then deploy to near. Uh, and that WebAssembly aims to be a, a fully faithful representation of the EVM uh, bytecode contract, uh, however translated to near, and with uh, some um, usability features that I'll, I'll show in a bit. Uh, so here's another example of a very simple contract, even simpler than the last one. This is a calculator contract with a single method multiply. You give it two numbers, and you get back a number. Super simple. Um, the way you would take this code and translate it into WebAssembly is you would download the compiler, which we are going to release our MVP, Minimum Viable Product, this week, a 1.0 version. Uh, you would download the binary for Windows, Mac, um, Linux, as you like, and you would feed it your Solidity contract. Uh, you can give the output file name, and once you have the output file, you just use the ordinary near CLI to deploy it on-chain. And this is super simple these days with the dev deploy command. That's a nice, uh, nice tool. After that, you can call your contract in such a way that the Solidity methods have been directly exposed 
as near contract methods that take JSON. So we have some magic there to map from JSON to, to the, uh, what, what the EVM needs in order to call a method. So this, this is uh, the intended uh, uh, use. And our current um, estimate is that using this approach, we are going to get at least a 15x speed up. So this is currently a naive compiler, non-optimizing. Um, it has a lot of overheads that could be removed over time. And already we are seeing, in any case, uh, this kind of figures. So in this, this example of our benchmark contract, uh, which is very CPU intensive, um, instead of taking 15, 1500 teragas, which is the, currently the case on Aurora, uh, the same contract could be run using just 100 teragas. So a massive, massive improvement. Not, not every contract is going to have such a massive improvement, because after all, some, some contracts are I.O. heavy, some are CPU bound. But uh, in any case, uh, we are looking at at least an order of magnitude uh, across most contracts. And this is why we are pursuing this project. Uh, this is why we've uh, added now effectively Solidity as one more supported language to NIR's repertoire, which means that NIR has now Rust, AssemblyScript, and JavaScript at least, uh, plus Solidity as languages using which you can develop for NIR. Um, and this project has been uh, a very nice collaboration between myself and, and Michael over there, if you would stand up, Michael, to be recognized. So you can hit up uh, either one of us about this project if you're interested. Uh, I wrote the compiler, Michael wrote uh, the runtime, so we have a nice split there. And we are also looking to hire um, people who know about compilers to join in developing this uh, going forward. We are looking for at least one uh, junior compiler engineer and uh, potentially a senior one as well. So in future directions, um, looks like I'm overrunning my time, so this will be short, but slides will be available. So some, some opcodes are a little bit more challenging than others, and I've listed here some. Uh, the, the main limitation of the current in, uh, compiler is that we don't do any cross-contract uh, calls whatsoever. So there are seven opcodes which are unimplemented. Uh, the 100 plus others are fully implemented, and it's not possible to do cross-contract calls. So this limits, of course, the utility. Uh, but uh, that's, a, that's a hairy can of worms that we haven't uh, gotten to yet. And, and some, some other opcodes need uh, um, different levels of runtime support and, and different overhead. So the compiler has flags to turn them off, off and on if you don't need those features. Um, what we plan to do right now is release the MVP this week, release uh, the 1.0, uh, make available binaries for download, and open the GitHub repository for collaboration from anybody who is interested, and, and blog about it and, and uh, document all of this. Um, and we begin to work on a test suite to give people some confidence that this is actually um, correctly compiling your contracts. Your precious, uh, expensive contracts uh, should be correctly compiled when uh, a lot of money is at stake. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. So uh, that's, that's everything in this 20-minute uh, slot, and we still have uh, one and a half minutes for questions. Go ahead. I, I'm afraid I can't hear you. Maybe it's not on. This one. Does it work? Oh, it works. Uh, have you compared the gas cost on near uh, from the contract written in near and the same contract written in uh, Solidity compiled to EVM to ASM? Yes, we have. Um, so that's a good question, and uh, the result is something something like. Um, with, with NIR, we can get 150x speed up, if I remember correctly, for this, this benchmark contract that I mentioned. And currently, with this uh, uh, implementation, we get a 15x speed up. So that, uh, that difference shows how much uh, more there is to achieve still in the speed ups. Uh, it's basic, basically showing us our absolute ceiling. The absolute ceiling where we can go from here is 150x. So that's nice to know. Perfect timing, so thank you all, and uh, look for this on GitHub shortly. All right, all right, thank you so much. And uh, wow, that's absolutely amazing. I don't know about you, but I love learning about compiler design, 
Um, I unfortunately didn't take that class in college, uh, like my undergraduate, but now that I'm in graduate school, I'm actually studying programming language design. So I was like literally on the edge of my seat for this entire talk. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, just a quick reminder uh, for other events that we have going on here at NearCon. I have this little blurb here I'm going to read. Wired Magazine asked sci-fi writer or prophet in its profile of this speaker, Stanley Chen, the author of the critically acclaimed novel The Wasteland and the future-looking compendium AI 2041. We'll talk about how he thinks about the future of technology and the creator economy at 4.15 p.m. on the Layer 1 stage. All right, well, uh, with that being said, next up we have Marcelo Fornet from Aurora Labs again, talking about the applications of cross-contract communications in Aurora. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, sorry, oh, here, that's it. Okay, uh, hi everyone, uh, nice to be here with all of you. Uh, I am Marcelo Fournette, a technical lead at the protocol team in Aurora Labs, and I will be here today presenting one feature. We have been uh, working for the last uh, several months, uh, which will help Aurora go beyond uh, its uh, current scope. Without uh, further ado, let's uh, start. So, uh, in the last, uh, like if you have been uh, listening to our uh, CEO, uh, talk uh, yesterday, Alex Shevchenko, he has been talking about achieving the next 1 billion users in Aurora and we have been working towards that goal in several fronts right now. One of the main points is about uh, usability. Uh, we have been working hard on the, our product team have been working on the Aurora Plus feature. Right now uh, we are trying to increase the scope of what we can achieve uh, with Aurora. Right now, uh, every contract in Aurora can only communicate with other contracts in Aurora, so people get to talk with us as in Aurora is a separate blockchain. In some sense, it is, but uh, Aurora is uh, actually, at its core, a fundamental part of NEAR ecosystem, and, uh, and it uses smart contract inside a NEAR blockchain. So basically, this means that we don't, need, we don't require a bridge to talk between NEAR and between Aurora, and that's with what we have been uh, working uh, recently. So, after um, uh, usability, our next uh, goal has been scalability. And Arto has been talking a lot uh, in the previous talk about how we plan to do uh, vertical scaling, which basically means that uh, how we can increase the amount of execution in the provided, uh, in the provided time slot that a near block uh, can execute, right? So, the way near on itself plans to scale in the future, and the future is basically now, if you have been following the news uh, on near, it's by charting. So it's a horizontal scaling. It's basically you have not necessarily very uh, big machines running uh, different charts, executing the code in parallel, where both state and execution it's charted at the same time. Since Aurora, uh, it uses smart contract on near, uh, smart contract is deployed on a single chart today. So we can get all the scalability that it's provided by a single, a single chart. So the whole point is that we at Aurora want to scale as near, uh, as near scales. And this is by increasing the, uh, the execution, like executing Aurora on multiple charts at the same time. But there are multiple uh, challenges to doing that, like doing that naively uh, won't work because of the whole asynchronous environment of near ecosystem. So basically, as Arto was uh, mentioning before, uh, doing the, the, the same call transaction, the, the call op code, it's a tricky one because in near, uh, this means that it requires a cross contract call. Okay? So that's what we are introducing today uh, to all of you. It's the possibility of doing a cross contract call between uh, Aurora smart contracts to other contracts on near, uh, on near ecosystem. So uh, we are going to provide. Right now, we uh, already have the core technology that will allow any smart contract in Aurora to communicate uh, with uh, any other contract on near. And let me go through how uh, it will work. Uh, I will be a little bit technical here, and tomorrow, or even like you can uh, talk to us at any moment. We have the booth at Aurora here, and tomorrow we will be showing 
a demo of uh, how it uh, works in practice. The core idea is that we will have a pre-compile. That's the way we usually do, well, well it's usually done in Ethereum and it's usually done in an EVM-like um, uh, environment to exit the system. So we have a pre-compile which is used uh, kind of like a smart contract on Aurora that you can be called with uh, special uh, arguments that will trigger the cross-contract call on your behalf. This will work by creating a separate near account. So if you are calling your account, let me just go to this slide, which is, gives you high level, very high level overview of, uh, of how it works. You are calling this uh, beef smart contract, 0x beef uh, smart contract on inside of Aurora that uh, wants to do some uh, liquidation on refinance on near. So you today, uh, you cannot call which, uh, from Aurora a smart contract on near. What will happen is that this uh, beef contract will call uh, this cross contract call precompile and this cross contract call precompile will deploy a new contract for you. This will be done on demand. This will be all be abstracted away from the users. So uh, a new contract will be deployed on, uh, on near, which will be called 0x beef dot Aurora. Uh, in this case, 0x beef is supposed to be like, uh, what, 40, 40 characters uh, long, but it's a quick representation. So 0x beef dot Aurora will be executing this cross contract call for you. So 0x beef calls uh, cross contract call precompile with all the arguments, like which function you want to call, which arguments you want to pass to the function, uh, all require arguments that it's uh, necessary to do the cross contract call. This uh, all information is passed to 0 aurora and 0 of Aurora will call, well, I was telling you like refinance, in this case I put as an example very clip the near, but uh, it's, uh, it could be like any, uh, any contract in the system. So one caveat here is that uh, each arrow, like, well, not each arrow, but last two arrows, will be cross-contract calls on near. This means that it, this will span at least through three blocks. Actually, this first arrow also means that uh, it's a separate block. But the overall, so the overall execution, theoretically, will be uh, four seconds, OK? Because each arrow is a cross-contract call, which in near means that it will be delayed uh, one, uh, one block each. But the overall execution, like the, the amount you need to pay in gas, uh, it's uh, uh, cheaper than actually than we were expecting in the very beginning. It turns out that uh, paying for uh, cross-contract calls on near it's uh, have been uh, decreased quite a lot in the last uh, in the last year, and this makes this process like where uh, this process such that the uh, heavy part of the gas it not it's not spent in the cross-contract call but in the actual relevant execution which will be in the serial x beef uh, part and well, ultimately in the very club the near part, okay? This is a very simplified uh, diagram of how it will work, but it will also allow you to do like uh, callbacks. So you will be able to get the response from your account from the execution very club on Aurora so you can react to this callback. This will certainly introduce uh, a new paradigm in the, uh, in the Aurora ecosystem because right now Aurora provides a synchronous, a synchronous model. So everyone is very used, every Solidity developer is very used to the model where either the whole transaction succeeds or the whole transaction fails. This makes possible things like flash loans, which are certainly not uh, possible, at least not naively on near, but they are possible on Aurora. If you are using cross-contract call, uh, we require developers to be aware about how near ecosystem works, how synchronous environment works, what are the limitations of what's happening here. So that's part of the next steps in our, uh, in our roadmap right now. We have at the moment all the core level primitives to make this done. And the next step is building an SDK that will make it easy for developers to actually use a cross-contract call to exit Aurora ecosystem and to communicate uh, with other contracts. Okay, so that's where every developer that is interested in this kind of feature could be uh, could reach out to me, and I will be more than happy to uh, interact with all of you to get feedback from what you are actually needing. We are in the process of building this SDK right now, uh, but we want to to get your feedback about exactly what uh, would be a, a good SDK for you in this case. Okay.
so right now let me just discuss uh, high L quickly few of the applications we have in mind but for sure just right now in this uh, conference I've been talking with a lot of uh, projects that are interested in this kind of feature that are not been even been mentioned here so one of the most interesting features is that we at Aurora have been uh, uh, proposed itself to provide a great infrastructure, great RPC, a uh, great interface for our users to interact with the system. This is part of what Aurora Plus value it's uh, uh, been provided. And that means that users of Near, like users of Aurora, can start to use uh, applications on Near ecosystem by going through uh, Aurora infrastructure. That will be one of the possibilities. So basically, you can keep using MetaMask to interact with uh, other uh, near smart contracts today by using this feature. Someone needs to build an application, like it's not uh, completely uh, doable, like instantly, but if, something, if someone is building like uh, layers of applications that allow Aurora users to interact with other near applications, well, that's something that will be certainly cool. Aurora users, like Aurora addresses, can be now uh, part of uh, can be down members on near ecosystem that was not possible before because even if you try to call Aurora externally uh, Aurora contracts cannot be represented outside of the of the system for example as down member but that's something that it's possible today one thing that I miss is that it's been for a long time possible to call uh, Aurora contracts from from near contracts so that's something that uh, it's still possible today but as part of, uh, of our SDK we want to integrate all this to make sure that you can both call Aurora contracts from near and near contracts from Aurora to showcase that Aurora is just part of the whole near blockchain without uh, requiring any sort of uh, breaches. So one of the demos we'll be showcasing tomorrow it's about how we can use this feature to, pair in, to paint uh, on a very club. It was a popular contract uh, on near in the very beginning. It's still being used today. Uh, so yeah, this is just one of some of the applications. You can own NFTs from your Aurora address today, and uh, you can uh, interact with like uh, NFT 171, which is the NFT standard from uh, Aurora, because you will have this uh, 0x beef dot Aurora, which is a near, a near account, not an Aurora account, okay? So well, yeah, proof liquidity in USN, you will be able to own like uh, near, you will be able to provide liquidity in USN. So for developers, uh, this is um, the main, uh, one of the main the first applications that we will be working on next. It's the Aurora native RC20 token. So basically, there are several tokens that have been deployed on Aurora as RC20s. They are living in Aurora, and unfortunately, they cannot uh, be exchanged on near or on Ethereum, even if we have a uh, Rainbow Bridge. So one of the first uh, applications that we're building is a connector that will allow you to move your RC20 from Aurora, like native Aurora tokens, to near NEP141, and later on it could be exchanged, like it could be transferred using Rainbow Bridge to Ethereum. Be, uh, notice, please notice that it's not necessary to use Rainbow Bridge to communicate between near and Aurora. It's used this cross-contract call uh, functionality. Actually, we have already something similar built from uh, native near NEP141 to Aurora, which uh, it could have been built using this feature if it uh, had existed like uh, one year ago. Um, one other application that I know there is a partner very interested in, uh, in building this, but it could be also any of you. It's a DeFi aggregator that do doesn't necessarily aggregate inside Aurora or inside near, but it could uh, aggregate tokens. It can root tokens through uh, several exchanges that both live in Aurora and near with the caveat that it will be just uh, several cross-contract calls that will happen, but it will be a very interested, uh, interesting scenario to uh, stress uh, this feature about, because usually these uh, aggregators, like if you have seen uh, one inch, they take like a, a lot of uh, cross, well, not cross-contract call, but a lot of calls uh, between several contracts. So that's certainly one uh, use case that would love uh, to see working. Okay, so just want to say that uh, we will be uh, like in a month uh, in uh, Bogota, so looking forward to see all of you uh, there, if any of you will be participating. Uh, yeah, we finish with uh, some time, so if you have any question, be more than happy to ask you answer here or at the booth later. Thank you.
Yes. Ah, you have. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. perfect. perfect. Great talk, by the way. I really enjoyed Thank that. Um, so I just have a, a, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll just ask one now and then maybe some more later. So the, when you're actually creating this like intermediary account, the, the, I guess in this case, 0, 0 x beef, uh, dot Aurora, um, will you actually swap out the, the, the I guess, the access key the, uh, to the one of the 0 x beef accounts so that they're able to access that after the cross-contract call? No, we don't want to add any access key to that account. That account will be, on, will be able to be called only by the Aurora contract. So only the Aurora contract, only your account on Aurora will be able to call, uh, to trigger uh, calls from Aurora. Oh, okay, I see. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I uh, didn't uh, say here is that we plan to have uh, two approaches to interact with uh, Aurora. One is uh, eager execution, which is basically that uh, once Aurora calls Aurora the whole execution starts uh, happening immediately in the same transactions, span out through multiple receipts, but it will be possible to do lazy execution as well, which will allow uh, much uh, complex use cases. So basically you store the whole transaction call in Cedric Bifdor Aurora, and then anyone outside of the system can continue the transaction. This will allow to, get, to run more expensive transactions uh, using very similar approach to what we have now. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, uh, thank you very much for participating today. Looking forward to see all the applications that you can build here. All right, all right. Thank you so much, Marcelo. Awesome, awesome. I always love hearing about what the Aurora team is doing. They're such a powerhouse. Can we hear another round of applause for Aurora? Woo! All right, uh, just two quick things before I introduce our next speaker. Uh, the Sweatcoin token generation event is occurring in four hours. Wow, that's crazy. So make sure that you go do some laps, earn some more Sweatcoin. Um, and then also, uh, it's just about 4 p.m. If you're needing a pick-me-up, we have, there's like uh, people with coffee machines out there and you can get a cappuccino or uh, an espresso, an Americano. They have all kinds of different coffee. Uh, absolutely delicious. Highly recommend. All right. So next up, uh, speaking about lessons from building app chains, we have Pandu. Hi, everyone. Um, can you guys hear me? I've, I've actually never presented like this before. Usually there's a speaker, right? But like it's, uh, it, the speakers are in your ear. I'm not too loud, right? Okay, really cool. Um, I'm, I'm actually, um, I actually created the first app chain on the Octopus Network. And I actually advised the second app chain on the Octopus Network. So if you guys are also interested in the Octopus Network, they have a booth right there. Uh, and you can talk to them as, as well. Um, it's, it's actually really cool. Um, my team actually came from the Substrate ecosystem. Uh, we also did a lot of Ethereum before. So Ethereum first, and then we moved on to Polkadot and Kusama. Uh, we realized that there were some issues, uh, commercial issues with actually deploying with Polkadot. So we decided to uh, deploy our, our projects on, um, on Octopus. Um, actually, I'm, yeah, okay. Right. Um, actually, they're going to be, they're going to be uh, projecting. So you don't have to, you don't have to connect. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so the first two projects of the Octopus Network is, uh, the first one is called the Bio Network, and once uh, we manage to get the slides up, I would be able to tell you all about it. Um, so the idea behind this is, of course, the Octopus Network is a relay chain, which is a concept unique to, uh, uh, to Substrate, um, that uh, basically the way it's done on NIR is that uh, there is a set of smart contracts on NIR that basically create the validators, and these are the validators that, that, that build uh, uh, basically uh, an Octopus app chain. So it is a shared security model. So when you stake Octopus tokens, you actually get our tokens, the Bio tokens, as rewards. And if you stake it on the Debio app chain, you get the Debio, uh, the Debio uh, sorry, uh, tokens. If you stake it on the Myriad app chain, you get the Myriad tokens. Okay, so um, we actually started the Bio network, um, at least the concept for it, many years ago. So um, my background, actually, I'm, I have uh, some bioinformatics experience. We've always been very interested in making sure that 
data and biomedical data in particular uh, is actually sovereign. It's not just owned by uh, you know large companies. So we created the bio network to solve that problem. Um, clicker, clicker, yeah, okay. So yeah, so the idea is democratizing everything, right? So we see like the 23andMe's of the world, uh, Ancestry.org, and a lot of the other personal genetic testing companies, they're very centralized. They have a singular database and uh, decisions on where to sell or buy the data, and uh, every, uh, all of this data is basically aggregated by one company. Now, there are actually a lot of, like let's say, uh, evolution in the way uh, genetic testing has been done, simply because the price of these uh, uh, PCR machines, the sequencers, are getting cheaper and cheaper. And especially because of COVID, because of the demand for it, a lot of people actually have the capacity to do personal genetic testing. A lot of companies, a lot of smaller labs. Now, the idea behind DBIO is we merge all of those uh, into basically uh, invite them to come onto the platform and sell their services on top of our platform in a way that is still decentralized that means that all of these labs can sell whether it's uh, any kind of, okay, so uh, whether it's um, actually sampling, so sending in physical samples to a lab, local lab, and then getting uh, reports back, or doing genetic analysis, so say you already have something from 23andMe, and you want to basically um, send um, your genome that you got from 23andMe, that genome file you send over to us, um, well, not to us, to a lab through the bio network and then get a report back because like uh, maybe you did the testing at 23andMe three years ago, you want to see if there are updates since then, things like that. Um, you can also basically request a service to be, uh, to be created. Like if you're, a, um, if you're a lab, if you're a research company, we've actually done several research projects like this uh, where uh, you can basically uh, search for a snippet of genes within a population, and uh, you can have like a research study that is done all on chain uh, on top of the application. Um, and finally, we also have something for electronic medical records, actually personal health records, because this is something that is self-reported. So this is actually something that we uh, are developing right now. It's for uh, a menstrual calendar. And this is actually very important uh, for, for uh, in terms of privacy, because there are issues now uh, about, uh, especially in the US, of, of, of privacy uh, being like, for the privacy of these apps, um, a lot of people are questioning the privacy of these apps. Let's, let's just say, like I'm, I don't want to be political. Um, like, because from these apps, from menstrual apps, regular menstrual tracking apps, you can actually track whether a woman has had an abortion, for example, just to say one case, yeah? So uh, this is something we're developing right now on top of the platform as well. This is actually key. Uh, when you're developing an app chain on the Octopus Network, you're not just creating a dApp. You're creating a, you're creating a platform where you can build multiple dApps. So when we did this, we are actually building smart contracts on top of our app chain, not on top of Near. Okay, so it is something that is already optimized for uh, these types of data, bioinformatics data, biomedical data, etc. So uh, you can actually already try. Like, so uh, the menstrual calendar is not yet yet up. But you can actually already try the genetic analysis feature. Uh, you, if you've already done any 23andMe or Ancestry.org personal genetic testing product, like if you've already done that, you usually receive something called the VCF file, which is the VCF file is actually your, your, your simplified genome. You can resend it to us to basically have another set of analysis, and that is totally anonymous. You pay via chain, you don't like reveal your KYC, and you get results back. It's already live, and we're currently doing like a free program for it. You can actually do it. Like, so uh, architecture of this, uh, it's, it's actually all on the website, but the idea is everything is encrypted in a way, you can take photos, it's fine. Uh, everything is encrypted in a way that uh, it's encrypted with the user's public key, so the, only the user would be able to decrypt it with their private keys. Everything is put into IPFS. IPFS is, of course, a public network. But since it's encrypted to the user's public key, it is still sovereign to the user. Um, there is uh, the labs themselves. So the darker color is actually where the lab is. Uh, genomic data and reports, they do everything, including uh, all of the wet work and analysis, and then send back the results. And this is actually something that we do for both, for data and for uh, basically physical samples. 
Now, how do you make an app chain? How do you make a blockchain that does physical data? What you do is basically you put the sample in an envelope, you sample yourself. So you self-source the sampling kit anonymously. Like there's, there's actually a lot of sampling kits that you can even buy on Amazon, for example. And you send over with an envelope. The envelope just has a code. That code basically refers to your public key. And uh, it connects back to you and it's sent back to you. This is actually already live. You can try it as well. <coughs> oh, uh, the website is dbio.network. So, yeah. Uh, you can also request services if you don't have services in your area and you want people to check out like uh, your area for like, uh, you want labs to basically come on board to Dbio, you can help us do that by basically staking tokens so labs would come. Uh, this is the economic flywheels analysis, like all of the, like, the aspects of the uh, uh, ecosystem. So yeah, uh, this is live, get your free genetic analysis. Just go there, you can actually sign up right there uh, just you can scan the, like you can take a photo now and then scan later. Um, you can basically uh, get genetic analysis on your genome for free, and uh, we would be able to, uh, yeah. Uh, if, and if you can share your experience, we would be uh, very happy. Yeah. So that's the bio. Actually, I'm also here to present about a project I'm advising because uh, they're the second option in the bio, in the Octopus Network. I'll be quick. Uh, it is called Myriad, and uh, if you haven't like uh, tried Myriad, uh, I think you're missing out because just go to app.myriad.social right now because uh, it actually is uh, social media. It looks like this. Uh, it can import posts directly from Twitter and Reddit, so it's an aggregator for social media, but it is also social media of its own. So you can post directly from Myriad, or you can basically import everything from Twitter and Reddit. And if, for example, I follow Elon Musk and um, I don't, I don't, you, sir, you import Elon Musk's post into Myriad, I would be able to see what you imported, like, because I follow Elon Musk, right? So it uses the same sort of like social graph that you have on Twitter and imports it into Myriad, so the people you follow are also followed on Myriad. And uh, if the posts are imported, there are two things that happens. First of all, it becomes a, a, a place where people can drop tips, which means like even though Elon Musk is not on Myriad yet, I can import Elon Musk's uh, a post, and then I can uh, tip Elon Musk directly on top of Myriad. The tip is kept within an escrow. That escrow is basically giving, will give the tokens to Elon Musk once he logs in. Okay, so, so that actually opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, yeah, and we have several other things as well, uh, which are really cool. First of all, we can use near wallets. So even though this is Octopus, you don't have to use a Polkadot wallet. You can use a Near wallet to log in. You can use a Kusama wallet to log in. You can use a Polkadot wallet to log in. Well, you, Polkadot account to log in. Or you can use the Myriad native account. Okay, so this is like multi-chain on top of this uh, social media. And uh, yeah, uh, we have 36,995 users. Mostly from Asia. I'm from Asia. We're from Asia. So if you guys want to like, you know, uh, add to the European community in Myriad, please do. Uh, please uh, sign up uh, with your near wallet, app.myriad.social, it's really cool. And uh, yeah, um, we uh, also have a metaverse. So last year, we actually won, uh, a small part of our team actually won uh, the meta build challenge for uh, the gaming, uh, basically the gaming uh, category. And uh, we have been developing it for a year. It's now live. You can go to myriad.town. Uh, that's the website, myriad.town. And uh, you can try it out. It is a live metaverse. NFTs of the actual LAN parcels will be selling soon. And it has integrations with Myriad Social as the social media app itself. Like you can access it from Myriad Social. And there's integration between the profiles as well. So this is um, like a lot of people basically ask us whether we're copying Meta, like Facebook and the, their Metaverse, right? We were created before Meta was created. So, uh, I mean, it was a synchronicity <laughs> for some reason. But like, yeah, we have a Metaverse and we have a social media for, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, oh, okay, so this is the Dibayo, uh, sorry, sorry for going back and forth, but like this is uh, actually the Dibayo overview of the, this is the demo of actually requesting uh, a new 
service. I don't know if you guys can see it at the back. It's really small, uh, but you can choose who is actually going to be doing your personal genome. So this is anonymous one way. So from the user's perspective, the users are anonymous, but you are actually sending like your, your genetic material to actual people. So um, it's anonymous one way, but the service providers do need to provide their you know, KYC and details. Um, you can, oh, so this is already the menstrual calendar. So you can basically choose your subscription and uh, your average menstrual cycle and when was the last time you had your period. Uh, you can also track, every, so this is, this is uh, basically a general uh, menstrual calendar. It's just that everything is saved in an, in an encrypted fashion with an IPFS. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it actually is a lot more secure. And of course, like no one, like except you, would have sovereignty over the data. And uh, yeah, you can view the statistics of your uh, menstrual period, and you would be able to know. Um, like if you're tracking pregnancy, for example, you can you can track your ovulation as well. Um, yeah, please sell your like. I guess most of the guys here are like hopefully like you can tell your wives <laughs> or girlfriends, right? Um, yeah. So next one is Myriad. Come on, Myriad, please load. Mm. Hello. There's supposed to be a Myriad demo here, but like for some reason it repeats. Uh, okay. So let me let me let's go real quickly. It's app.myriad.social. You can actually open it yourself. You don't really. Oh, oh, I actually skipped it. I was the one who skipped it. it was my fault. Okay. Yeah, this is the Myriad demo. Can you guys press play for me? Thank you. So, um, Myriad, um, we aggregate social media and we can import. Uh, you can see there that's actually a Twitter uh, post. That's a Twitter URL. We place it in there. We create a post. Once it's created, you can tip it. You can send tips. You can share. You can comment. This is actually cool because it, it means it's uncensorable. Like, you, if, you, if, if you want to basically save someone's post, you can put it into Myriad. Um, you can send tips to people like that. This is with Near. You can also use Polkadot. You can also use Kusama and Myriad's native wallet. Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, oh, this is. Oh, I actually skipped this. Uh, I'm very sorry. But like uh, Myriad is actually not just uh, Web3. It's also a federated social media. So if you guys know Mastodon or Diaspora, like the older federated social media, it's decentralized but in a federated way. Uh, we are both. So you can actually host your own social media and create, it's like a social media engine. You're creating your own social media for your community or for like your beliefs. Um, and uh, you can create a new instance. An instance is basically like a, like, um, it's like a node, but it's for federation basically. And uh, yeah, and you would be able to create a new instance and that would be a separate Myriad instance from the regular one. Um, yeah, I have two minutes left if anyone has any questions. Um, okay, uh, you can contact me. I am at, my, my email is ceo at thebio.network. Uh, I'm CEO there. And uh, uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Okay. Anju, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Woo! How about that? I always love companies that focus so much on privacy and, you know, that's a big issue in people uh, with companies that, you know, maybe aren't so involved with Web3 is they'll just take your genetic information and do who knows what with it. So always love to hear about companies that value your privacy. All right. Are we, are we ready for, are we good? Okay. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, even, even when NearCon is done for the day, there are still side events that you can check out at nearcon.org. There's a link there on the top of the page called Side Events, and you can check those out and party all night long. All right, next up, we have Keypalm. We've reinvented Web3 onboarding, and you're going to like it. From Ben and Matt... <laughs> Welcome up, guys. <laughs>
Thanks, Jacob. And then Thanks, Jacob. Take it away, guys. We need a clicker. Oh yeah, we need a clicker. Oh, perfect. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so we're here to talk about Key Palm, and if you haven't heard already, uh, it's pretty lit, fam. And, it's going uh, to the moon. It's going to the moon. So a quick overview of the agenda today. What we're going to talk about is basically who we are, why we're here, the Web3 onboarding problem, a little bit about the Key Palm solution, but since it, we already built it, we're gonna talk about how it works, and then we're gonna talk about what you can do today with KeyPalm, and we're also gonna talk about where KeyPalm has already been used, and we're gonna talk about our future work. So, who are we? Uh, basically, uh, Ben, I'll let you introduce yourself first, and then I'll go. Awesome, yeah, my name is Ben Couric. I'm a subject matter expert when it comes to NFTs, smart contracts, access keys, pretty much everything smart contracts on near. I work for Pagoda, I co-founded FAIR, and I'm, I'm really passionate about innovation and, uh, and technology. Awesome, thanks Ben. So my name is Matt Lockyer, and uh, I have a background in UX research. I was in the Ethereum community for a while. I joined Near in May 2020. I worked on the wallet team, and then I joined the DevRel team and worked a lot with the NFT standards and the marketplaces. I'm currently with Proximity, and I'm passionate about crypto adoption. All right, so this is big. So why are we here? Uh, basically, Web3, crypto, blockchain, whatever you want to call it, it's all about the sovereign ownership of your assets. It's all about basically creating and exchanging values without intermediaries. So this is about P2P coordination. It's about us being able to do what we want with each other online, and it's about nobody kind of getting in the way. It's, it's really about privacy and freedom at the end of the day. Now, none of this will matter unless people can use the apps, right? Like if they're confused, if they have to go through a bunch of jargon, if they have to jump through a bunch of hoops, it's just not gonna work because we can't get everybody on board. You shouldn't have to be techno-literate to use crypto and blockchain. So the Web3 onboarding problem is really the fact that a user must create an account before they can do anything of value and what we really want to do is we want to flip that model and we want them not to have to like be educated and understand a bunch of shit. We would just want them to use the products. We want them to use the apps immediately, then see the value from the app that they're using and then we want them to create wallets and actually claim the value kind of post hoc. So Web2 has this, they have frictionless onboarding. You go to a website, you just start using a demo, right? And then maybe you create your account after you've created something and you need to save it. Why can't we do this with Web3? Well, thanks to the near blockchain and thanks to access keys and the account model, we can. So the key bomb solution. Did anyone go to the party last night? Show of hands. Or the party on, uh, on or Monday. Or the party on Sunday. Or, or Monday. <laughs> so if you got a ticket, your ticket was just a link. And that link showed a QR code. When you clicked on the ticket, it made a transaction to the near blockchain, but you didn't have a wallet. When the ticket was scanned, it made a transaction on the near blockchain. Those people didn't have a wallet. You didn't, nobody needed to create a wallet to actually do things on the near blockchain. And this is all made possible by access keys. And Ben, you're gonna talk a little bit about how it works in a moment. This is the key point though. You can take a link, something you're familiar with, get a QR code, something you're also familiar with, you can go to a party, you can get value, and then later on, you can create a wallet from that same link and you can claim an NFT, or do many more things, which we're gonna also talk about. So, really quick, just to sum up the NFT ticketing use case, there were no wallets, there was no Wi-Fi that needed to be used. There was no burning of NFTs or any other complicated stuff. So you receive an NFT and a wallet to show that you were there after you've enjoyed all of the value and interaction and the coordination that I was talking about amongst multiple different parties. So 
I think it's pretty impressive. And now Ben is going to talk about how it works. One, one more quick point in that is that um, you only get the NFT, you only get onboarded once you've actually showed up. Right, so it sort of eliminates that use case where people go, they get a ticket, they get the NFT, but they never actually show up to the event, which I think is really important too. So it's actually a proof of attendance, rather than just you know going, stealing the link, and then just you know it's in your wallet, but you never actually showed up to the event. But uh, you know I'm going to talk a little bit about how it works right now from a more developer standpoint. So what you do, you go to the app, you go to our contract, you deposit some near into your account. We have a sort of uh, debiting system in place. So you deposit a bunch of NIR and it's in your account and you use it over time. We did this so that there's seamless, seamless user experience when you're actually on site because a lot of the stuff costs NIR and you don't want to constantly be, uh, be redirected over to the NIR wallet to sign transactions and all that stuff, right? So if we keep a, a sort of one time, let's say you deposit, I don't know, 500 NIR, you can use that for essentially the rest of the week or you know, however many tickets that you're creating or use cases you're doing. But yeah, so that's step one. Deposit some NIR into your account. Step two is you create a drop. This drop outlines essentially the behavior that, uh, that, that, that's going to be used when the key is claimed, right? So you can have an NFT ticketing sort of drop. You could have a fungible token drop, NFT drop, even just like a simple link drop, right? So you create the drop, right? And then after that, you add keys, as many keys as you want. You can have one key, two keys, three keys. You can have 100,000 keys. Let's say you want to onboard a million users. You can create a drop with a million keys, right? And then after that, you hand out the keys however you want, whatever distro app you want to use, right? You give out the keys, they're used, and then all of the logic is executed on chain. Keys can be used either to claim to an existing account, right? So let's say you've, you've, you're sort of, you're in the near ecosystem, you have an account already, right? You just want to claim, you want to get the assets, the fungible tokens, the NFTs, you know, the function calls, all to an existing account, you can do that. But you can also claim to an entirely new account that's never been created before. So it will create the account for you. You don't need to go through any of the onboarding process, none of the like implicit account, fun through moon pay, all that stuff. You don't need any of that, right? You can just create an account on chain basically for free. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and just uh, something about the numbers. We use these for a couple of the parties. The party on Sunday night, we actually created like 1,700 keys and we just basically started giving them out. We had about 14 different drop types. Each, each drop type had a different kind of custom NFT um, and it all worked really seamlessly. So Ben, what about the config? Yeah, so there's a whole ton of optimizations and a ton of customizable features that you can have when creating these drops. I'm just gonna go through a couple of them. So one is like a deposit per use. So every time the key is used, how much near gets sent to the claimed account? One near, two near. If you're familiar with the existing link drop contract, they have a hard-coded one near minimum, so you can't go below one near every time the link drop is claimed. This, you can go as low as you want. You can create a link drop with even no near, no deposit per use, but if you're creating a simple link drop, this is actually 99.8% cheaper than the existing link drop contract. Another one, the uses per key. So let's say you created a drop, you wanna give it out to a whole bunch of people and you want them to be able to use it multiple times. You can actually create a multiple use access key system. So you can have one key that can be claimed one, two, three, four, 100, 500, however many times you want, just that one key. Another thing is a throttle timestamp. Let's say you have a key that has 10 uses, but you don't want it to be used Bam, 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 bam. You can create a throttle timestamp to throttle the time in between each use. Another thing, let's say you have your own uh, link drop contract, right? So let's say you want every single account to be a sub account of your account. So I think we have endless here. Let's say they want to onboard all of their users and they want every single one of their account IDs to end with dot endless dot near. You can do that too. You can specify a custom drop route if you want. Awesome, Ben, thanks. Um, so let's talk about drop types. Yeah, so if you're familiar with simple link drops, we've got a simple drop. This is essentially what everything is built off of. The simple link drop with just near in, uh, embedded into the key. That's for transferring near, for onboarding, really easy. We've also got NFT drops and fungible token drops. They're sort of wrappers around that simple drop. So not only can you do near, you can also add NFTs, fungible tokens. Let's say you want to onboard a user and send them an NFT. Boom, you can create an NFT drop as well, fungible token drop. 
And then the creme de la creme, which is the most powerful feature, I think, of key palm is function call drops. When your key is used, you can go and actually execute functions on chain. Let's say you want to do auto registration into a DAO, lazy mint an NFT. All of this is possible through key palm. Awesome. So we've been talking a lot about how you can use key palm. Um, maybe as a developer, you can use our contract directly or you can use our front end here. Now, our front end looks a little clunky, uh, and that's because we did apply to the Near Foundation for a grant to hire maybe some of you lovely developers in the audience and kind of bring more developers into our ecosystem, but we were denied. And why? Because we already work in the Near ecosystem. And they said, no dice. Wink, wink. Maybe we, need, maybe we do need a grant because it would be really awesome to have a no-code front end for Keep On, right, everybody? Yeah, okay, people are actually listening. Uh, so anyway, moving on, I wanna drill into what Ben said was the creme de la creme, which is the function call, the function call drops. These are really, really cool. This is actually how we did the NFT tickets because we didn't know who was gonna claim the NFTs, so why would we create them ahead of time? So instead, we made an NFT contract that could actually have the NFTs lazy minted with a function call that was approved from the key palm contract. So it's really key palm doing a function call to the NFT contract and the NFT is created and then shot into either a new or existing wallet. This is an awesome use case, especially an awesome user experience as well because they just create their near wallet and the NFT is there already when they go look at it. So every key use, just a little bit on like kind of like the nerdy details, Every key use can actually have a vector of methods called. So you can do like whatever you want. You can, you can have like one method and then another method and another method. Um, so keys with multiple uses can have a different vector for each use. So like you could basically create a key that was like membership in a DAO and then it was sort of vote three times and then it was sort of maybe claim some sort of reputation to an existing wallet or a new, a new wallet. So you can do user onboarding that actually takes the user through multiple steps of creating value on chain and then retroactively put that value into an account. So key uses can also be null or just empty. Um, and just to describe why you would do this is sometimes you just want to know that the key is on the first use, the second use, the third use, and that is exactly how we did the NFT ticketing system because we wouldn't let people scan and get into the event uh, until a certain point. And then after they scan, we need to kind of show them that they can now create a wallet and claim. So the front end for the tickets was actually referencing how many times the, the key has been claimed. So whether it's like step one, step two, step three. So it's a very cool system and we had a lot of fun building it. So on to some other use cases. Um, I'm gonna let Ben talk about this. Sure, yeah, so this is, uh, I think what I really wanna stress is that this is not just for NFT ticketing. You can use Keypalm for so many different things and this is just what we thought of. So like, let's, uh, let's play out a little scenario here. I hired Matt, right, as a contractor. Unlikely, I, I probably hired you. Yeah, like he probably would hire me, but let's just say that I hired Matt as a contractor and uh, he's demanding 500 USCC per week for doing something, right? Now, the traditional approach should be, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna set up a server, or I'm gonna set a reminder on my phone every week to go log into my near wallet, go send 500 near, using the like fungible token contract and send them 500 USDC, right? Or you could set it up in a server and have it automatic, but then you need your full access key in there and all that, all that mumble jumble. But what you can do with Keypalm is let's imagine you create a fungible token drop. I give Matt, let's say I'm employing him for 12 weeks. I create a key with 12 uses on it. So Matt can use this key 12 times. I then set a throttle timestamp of a week. So Matt can only use this key once a week. Then what I do is I load up that drop with a whole lot of USDC. How maybe I can preload all 12 weeks or maybe I do it a week at a time. It doesn't matter, right? Then all I need to do is just give Matt the key. That's it. He has the key. He can claim the fungible tokens whenever he wants. Doesn't matter, it's up to him. But he has the key. He can claim the fungible tokens and everybody's happy. So that's one use case. 
Another really cool aspect of this would be that obviously if Benji is not happy with the work, I don't know why he wouldn't be. I mean, he can revoke the key at any time because he is the, he is the administrator of the drop and of all the keys in the drop. So he can revoke the key, which would of course cancel my streaming payments. Another uh, use case, backend servers. So there's been a lot of times in the near ecosystem and, and not even just in the near ecosystem where things get hacked, servers get hacked, you know, secrets get exposed. For example, let's say you have a server that has a full access key because you need to attach some near, right? That's very common. You have a function that requires a near deposit. That means you have to have a full access key to sign the transaction. If you're doing all of this in a server and your server gets, you know, breached, you lose your full access key. That's, that's a no-no. We don't want to lose our full access key. So what you can do is you can use KeyPalm to create a function call drop and then use that function call in your backend server. You can cycle the keys. You can create multiple keys in the drop. You know, it's, it's, just, it's way more secure because if you lose that key, it can only be used to call one thing and one thing only, and that's either claim or create account and claim. You can also change your permissions to only allow the key to, to call claim or only allow the key to call create account and claim. But if you lose the key, what's going to happen? It's going to do what you think it's going to do, and that's what is outlined in the drop. That's great. And then another one is quick onboarding, mass onboarding. So the one near hard-coded link drop value in the current link drop contract is completely bypassable. You can create one uh, link drop with about 0 0.0005 near, right? So you can mass onboard hundreds of thousands of users with KeyPalm and create a bunch of these simple drops. You can also do fungible tokens as well. It doesn't matter. It's up to you. But you can make really, really easy and really quick onboarding. I use it all the time. You know, through my startup fair, there's a lot of not crypto native people that I need to onboard into the Near ecosystem. I just create a simple drop. I give them a key. Boom, they're onboarded onto Near. Super simple. Awesome. So this one's pretty interesting. Uh, let's see if Let's see if the developers in the audience can keep pace with this one. This one's getting, getting a little bit freaky, you know, sort of pushing, push, pushing the boundaries of, of what you can do. So let's, let's imagine that you have a, fun, a function call drop that actually goes and adds more keys when a key is used. So you're calling the method add key whenever one key is used. So you could create like a drop that has three uses, the first two add another key, and then the last one goes and actually lazy mints you an NFT. Uh, and so you could expand on this and have some sort of social media, like breadth first traversal thing where you create a, a drop that goes and calls the add keys on another drop, which goes and does you know this like massive key creation thing. And you only get the NFT if your friends have claimed your keys or something, just some marketing stunt, but you know, just pushing the boundaries of what you can do here. I think it's pretty interesting. It is a marketing stunt. We're developers. We hate marketing. So, I mean, maybe you can do the marketing. So, uh, where is Keepom used? Let's talk about a couple of spots. Uh, ben, you want to take the first couple? Sure, yeah. So, Endless, I see them in the audience here. You know, we've had a lot of conversations with them about the back-end servers. They find it really interesting. We did uh, some of the POAPs at ETH Toronto. We did the proximity party. You know, uh, we did the near week party as well, which was not a party that we sort of had firsthand in organizing. But, you know, I was getting some messages from the organizers that basically said, uh, you know, they love it. And uh, that's great. That's great feedback. Um, we also did some po apps for Pagoda uh, here at NearCon. And also uh, we did it for your company fair. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about future work. So right now, uh, Key Palm is basically, uh, it's a very simple kind of like, um, it's a very simple kind of serial, like linear process of claiming. It's sort of claim this, claim that, claim that. I'm particularly passionate about kind of getting a V2 going where we can create a more complicated uh, state machine where we can go from like step one to step two and loop back to step one and go to step two and basically have a whole bunch of other interesting things going on. I want to embed little data structures in there so instead of just sort of incrementing the steps, we can actually control different variables and we can keep track of different pieces of data as the users are calling claim. Um, why this is important is because we can actually create a lot of really deep integrations with a lot of the apps on Near, And then, as I mentioned before, 
in kind of a join a DAO and vote three times use case, we can actually retroactively send the reputation that you've voted three times and participated to the newly created account. So really the key comes down to people, the key comes down, pun intended, comes down to basically people getting value out of using the near blockchain without having to set up a wallet. And another aspect of this is that sometimes when you go to use uh, the blockchain, you don't have your wallet on your phone or you don't have it on even your laptop. It's on your ledger. You just wanna go to an app and start using it. And then you know, you know maybe the name of your account on your ledger and you just wanna shoot all the assets into there after you've sort of you know, maybe played a game or completed a challenge or done some education thing, like a learn to earn. So really, this is actually not just for new users, it's for existing users as well. Ben, do you have any topics you wanna to cover on future work? No, I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of work to be done on the, on the contract side. We're, we're pushing out some new NEPs to, to, uh, to really enhance some of the technology in terms of like getting gas prices on chain, getting access key allowances on chain in the runtime and stuff. So I'm working uh, pretty hard with the working groups there to get those NEPs through. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, this has been a blast building out this contract and uh, you know, it's been fun. Awesome. All right, so that's it. Thanks everyone. And I hope you enjoyed it. Keep on. <laughs> Matt and Ben, thank you guys so much. Woo. Well, what an amazing project. And I believe that wraps up our lineup today at the Doomslug stage. Thanks everybody so much for coming and uh, make sure to come back to this stage tomorrow for even more technical topics. <laughs>